There is a magical operation of maximum importance. The initiation of a new aeon. When it becomes necessary to utter a word, the whole planet must be bathed in blood. This is the full cinematic story of the legacy of Kane, Blood Omen. The following introductory information to the series comes directly from Crystal Dynamics' former website. Kane is the youngest son of an aristocratic family, seeking gold and glory in the hinterlands of Nosgoth. His haughty arrogance has won him no allies, and it's in the mud wallow, pathetic excuse of a village, Ziegstrul, Kane's story begins in earnest. Or should I say, his downfall. The tavern's closing. Best be on your way, stranger. What? No mug of ale for a weary traveller from distant Corhagen? I can reward you well, for I am of noble blood. I stay open for no man in these dark times. Things come with the night that no sane man would welcome. And so I left. Cold of heart and soul. Forced to the road and the long, bitter night. That's him! As we exit the relative safety of the tavern, we are set upon by a cluster of orange-hooded cutthroats who lie in wait, soon overwhelmed by the sheer volume of biting blades from our unknown assailants. End it, now! And our last earthly experience is the cold tip of a claymore piercing our heart. Vey victors, suffering to the conquered. Ironic that now I was the one suffering. Not anything as pedestrian as physical pain, rather the cruel jab of impotent anger. The hunger for revenge. I didn't care if I was in heaven or hell. All I wanted was to kill my assassins. Sometimes you get what you wish for. The necromancer Mortanius offered me a chance for vengeance, and like a fool, I jumped at his offer without considering the cost. 
Nothing is free. Not even revenge. <laughs> you will have the blood you hunger for. I awoke to the pain of a new existence, in a dank womb of darkness and decay. Cast from the jaws of oblivion, we find ourselves freshly exhumed in an unfamiliar crypt. Compelled by a burning vengeance, we begin to feel our way blindly out of the stone labyrinth to the north wall and see a switch that liberates us from our tomb. And to the west, a spell card we activate exclaiming. The sanctuary spell enables me to travel to my crypt where the soil of my grave provides me respite. I often resort to this when I am weak and need nourishment. Heading north, we enter a dimly lit room with a lone grave digger wielding a shovel in an unwelcoming manner and deal with him accordingly. Perhaps our new visage will cause all we meet to act in kind. With our path unobstructed, we head west and find another spell card bearing the image of a floating, blackened heart. Reputed to have been ripped from the chest of the greatest vampire to have ever existed, Janos Audron, the heart of darkness restores vampiric unlife. Life is precious, Janos discovered, as it was torn, throbbing and bleeding from his own body. Shackled to a northern wall, we find a peculiar sight, a wretch of a woman struggling and bound to a wall. We also discover a newfound hunger and slake our thirst accordingly. This ancient vial bears with it a dark gift indeed, for with it my life force is increased. To the east, we encounter another morsel that choose to enter misery rather than feed. Casually collecting the magical trinket by her side. These ancient symbols of power contain raw magical energy that increases my own capacity to summon energy for the spawning of spells. In the room ahead, the undead are called forth, presumably in response to our trespassing. <laughs> With the undead defeated, we discover a monolithic structure in a room to the west, adorned with glyphs that enables us to save our progress. Within the walls of these chambers, I could find respite. And if I so chose, resume my journey when my weariness abated. After a short rest, we exit the mausoleum, and Cain sees the world for the first time as a vampire. The world had changed to my eyes. I had not expected such cruelty from the light. For in the embrace of the sun I could find no comfort, only malice. This would change in time for the worse, along with other things. When rainfall comes, vampires are wise to find shelter from its acidic touch. With our skin scorched from the rain, we feed on an errant groundskeeper to soothe our burns and make a beeline for a nearby tomb. Inside, we find much of the same enemy's pathetic attempt at impeding our quest for vengeance. The only boon to speak of was a flay artifacts we found during our exit. These curious devices hurl bolts of whirling energy and eviscerate my human enemies by stripping ragged flesh from blood-stained bone. And of course, we decide to test the artifact to magnificent effect. We feast, perhaps a final time, before exiting the tomb. Sensing our assassins are near. Hunger and weakness are no bar to vengeance's call. I would find my slayers and send them back whence I came. As promised, we stalk our prey into the nearby glade. The rain's acidic touch be damned, as we revel in the terror and carnage. What trickery is this? Have a cheek, sir. If we put you down once, we could do it again. Their sneering faces were forever etched upon my memory. I had crossed death for this moment. My mind was empty save for one thought. I would kill. <laughs> oh. 
with the band of brigands all but obliterated, we savor the final foe's bloody demise. There is no greater release than that from vengeance sated. With my assassins dead, my quest was over. Tis not over, Cain. These fools were merely the instruments of your murder, not the cause. Look to their masters, look to the pillars, and gain way to the fortress of the mind. So, the necromancer Mortanius has revealed the cutthroat serf an unknown master that lay by the pillars of Nosgoth. But first, to visit the wretched town, Ziegstel. This was where the bloody deed of my murder took place. I would not be kind to the denizens that lurk here. They would taste my steel, and I their blood. Entering the town from the northern path, we see that the carts that had previously blocked our escape have miraculously disappeared. It's time, we think. We shall visit the barkeep who doomed us to our fate. Inside the tavern, a knight errant and his wench attack to no avail. Once disposed of, we see the barkeep is visibly shocked at our return, yet safely hidden behind his bar. Furious that he remains unmolested by our blade's biting edge, we stalk through the village, drinking deep from the sleeping villagers and growing in power. And in one home, pilfer some flay artifacts lying about. Now with a means of offence against the barkeep, we dutifully re-enter the tavern, shocked ourselves to see our assailants have re-risen as spirits, yet happily put them down again in their ethereal form. Once more, we visit the cowering barkeep, but this time, eviscerate the fool on his feet. First, he loses his protectors, and now his flesh falls to the floor. He's slipping badly. Leaving the town after slaughtering the rest of the denizens therein, we casually crush any remnants of brigands that dare bar our path to the pillars. The necromancer had offered me no warning as to what my resurrection would entail, and yet I must confess in my haste I had not sought one. Was his gift a curse? I would seek the pillars for an answer. After contending with the bulk of meager marauders, we make our way north through the forest, slaying the last mace-wielding warrior. <laughs> and spying the fabled pillars of Nosgoth. The pillars of Nosgoth. Even in life, few sights have moved me such as this. I marvel that such beauty should grace our dying world. Shrouded in a small alcove nearby is what our enemy had clearly hidden, a means to teleport to the previously inaccessible pillars. As we step off the octagonal pad towards the pillar, we sense something is very wrong, and we are not alone. And it's then we spy a spirit haunting the stone monument, and approaching her, she says, Nopraptor, your madness has shattered our dreams and blinded you. Keep your distance, or I'll send you back to hell, spirit! There is nothing left of me to fear, vampire. I'm only a shadow of my former self, Ari, the balance of the Circle of Nine. Even so, I can provide the answers you seek. I seek only a cure. There is no cure for death, only release. You must destroy the sorcery, the sorcery that is now poisoning Nosgoth. Only then will you realize peace. The nine of the protectors of hope were sworn to use their powers to preserve our world. Now these pillars have been corrupted by a traitor. My murder at the hands of this beast drove my love Napraptor mad. Now he spreads misery and pain among the circle crumbling the very foundation of Nosgoth. You must restore balance. You must right the pillars of Nosgoth. I care not for the fate of this world. Then for yourself, Cain. Beware.
the unspoken. And so ends our quest for the Pillars, but our search for vengeance continues against the Pillars' maddened guardians and for the very soul of Nosgoth itself. Nupraptor, with his blind act of vengeance, threatened to destroy all of Nosgoth. Each Circle member was bonded to the pillar he served. The pillars reflected the mental state of their servants, and as the minds of the Circle degenerated and descended farther into dementia, the pillars crumbled. To restore them, each member of the Circle had to die, and the artifact that served as their link to the pillar had to be returned. Only when all the pillars were restored did Ariel claim my curse would end. And so, my hunt for Nupraptor began. With our true target of revenge now revealed, we take a closer examination of the pillar belonging to Nupraptor, the demented architect of Nosgoth's potential doom. The pillar of the mind, protected by the mentalist Nupraptor. Thankfully, the degradation of the pillars isn't too advanced. Yet. But we fear we have little time to spare. Heading west, we take the teleporter pad that is promised to lead us to the mentalist's retreat. Upon arriving at a forest alcove, we see another strange obelisk southwest on our path. These beacons serve as landmarks during my flights in bat form. Once I have committed their locations to memory, I can always return. In bat form, I can travel great distances with ease. From my vantage in the heavens, no region of Nosgoth is forbidden to me. To the south, we see two mace-wielding lackeys approach us, no doubt at the Guardian's behest, the first of many more to come. <laughs> to the west, we enter a nearby shrine. And inside, we see a picture of Cain on the darkened floor, which alludes to the dungeon's unique spell. Exploring the dank dungeon and dodging its degenerate denizens, we discover the spell that we desire. While it is true that natural light weakens a vampire, magical light can have many uses indeed. Upon activating said spell, our path then becomes clear. It should be noted, Blood Omen follows a pretty standard formula of Cain entering dungeons, caves, and unique landmarks littered across Nosgoth. Inside said dungeons, we the player find a similar symbol on the floor for either a spell, item, or ability at the entrance usually. And after defeating the dungeon's many inhabitants and solving its puzzles, we then leave Enriched and Cain with new abilities. For clarity's sake, as this is a lore play which is meant to primarily showcase case, Cain struggled to enact revenge on his betrayers and the story of Blood Omen in a timely manner, these dungeons will be heavily reduced as they can become quite tedious, generic, and honestly somewhat dated. And so for posterity's sake, we're going to touch on the abilities, spells, and items Cain finds, but in a much more heavily condensed manner to help propel the story forward, however, not cutting out Cain's important growth of his formidable arsenal and abilities, which are essential to his quest. As daylight chases darkness, the vampire's power wanes. Southwest in a gully, we find more brigands, their coloured hoods denoting their quote-unquote abilities. From the more pitiful, sword-swinging, orange-hooded blade fodder, to the purple, garbed knife throwers. The only thing sharp about these foes is the angles they blindly turn. <sighs> Heading north, we find a new enemy, a wild dog, that falls with one swipe of our sword. With the town of Nactome, but a stone's throw away, we're tempted to head west and ignore the cave. However, inside we see the mark of a beast and a promised spell. Inside a spike-laden temple, at the end of a short but treacherous walkway littered with bodies, we find the promised spell cart that gifts a dark transmutation. My lupine form enables me to move like lightning and leap over obstacles barring my path. But the guise of the wolf brings with it its own kind of hunger and rage. A path now removed, we try to travel to the other side to no avail. And thus we must change into our lupine form. 
Most notable of the wolf form's unique skill set is the ability to leap small gaps which were previously inaccessible to Kane. Also of note, the wolf boasts a powerful swipe attack, however getting in range, being closer than the sword, but not too close as to confuse the enemy AI, allowing us to rip the flesh from the foul fiend's jugular. As previously stated, these dungeons were mostly designed to force the player to get used to the new abilities. However, as we exit the cave, it becomes quickly apparent that our leap ability has already become invaluable in our repertoire of skills. First, leaping above the northern ledges that barred our path, and then second, the small body of water that is still acidic to the touch in our beast form. We then collect by a forest multiple hearts of darkness and some flays before heading into a new dungeon with some now familiar spike traps. However, we're promptly met with a halberd wielding guard and realize our lupine form is vulnerable due to close quarters and rely on our flays instead. Indeed, for all of the beast's enhanced agility, we cannot wield magic whilst in this form. A path now unlocked, we head north through the double doors, now open, and find a teleporter. Transported back to the beginning of the beast cave, we head outside and see one of our own kind that falls with a single swing of our claw. Bounding over the hills towards our goals, past a sign that tells us Nactome is nearby, we then discover a bat flight point to the west, and as we retread our path back, we see just above a small lip one of the fabled Spirit Forge's entrances. Once inside, Kane shares its history and warns. One must be wary in dealing with the Spirit Forges. The wraith and shades that inhabit them offer items beyond mortal dreams in exchange for a sampling of your blood. The wraith smiths forge their items with forfeit souls. Shed your blood for me, and these artifacts will be yours. Imagine what power you could wield. Reluctantly, we agree to his price. So, you come to the Spirit Forge for help, do you, vampire? Trade your secrets for the blood of the dead, I will. With our life force now drained to a dangerously low level, we've been gifted ten flays. And although the artifacts are invaluable against our enemies, we have a dire need to feed, and heading west, we walk into a potential ambush. <coughs> Having successfully dodged death once more, we drink our fill from the gaggle of marauders before heading into a nearby mausoleum and find the Energy Bolt Shrine. The shrine itself is guarded by a new enemy that seem to be scimitar wielding foes on first appearance. However, their scimitars extend like long pole arms, aided by a duo of mages on the level above who hurl their honing missiles at us. Ducking out of harm's way and into the western wing of the shrine, we discover the formidable energy bolt spell. The energy bolt employs magical force in its rawest form, a messy spell but a potent one nonetheless. Forced to change back to our vampiric form so we can harness the magics, we test out the energy bolt spell on a nearby mage. It takes three bolts to fell them, but to great effect. After felling many mages and solving the shrine's puzzles, we dodge incoming electricity bolts and scimitar wielding inhabitants. We find ourselves met by darkness, and our strength once again returns. We see, finally, that Nactome is now within our grasp, and as we head around the back of the shrine and north, dodging familiar canines, we enter the cave above a lip to an unfamiliar sight. The blood of ages flows so sweet. Come drink from us. Although somewhat wary of the promised power from the bloody shrine, we're compelled to drink from its crimson waters. 
Your strength has increased, for our blood enhances. Post drinking the Crimson Icor, we can feel our strength enhance, but are not sure exactly how. Regardless, with our newfound vigor, we dispatch the nearby canines with little effort, and heading north, we find a bridge that is blocked by three boulders. The village of Nachtholm was typical of Nosgoth peasantry. Yet amidst the farmers and smithies of the quiet country life, prowled brigands and cut purses. As we begin to move across the bridge, we're startled to find our newfound strength renders the boulders little more than a nuisance. And so we head to the closest tavern, returning to our vampiric form as to not startle the inhabitants. Well, any more than our undead countenance does. But regardless, we're met with a rather cold reception. The tavern's local dregs, male and female alike, are up in arms with their pitiful arsenal of broken bottles and long nails used to scratch. A little more than a distraction not worth our time. And so we transform into our lupine form, leaping over the bar in a single bound and slashing the throat of the barkeep with a single strike before plundering the three chests in the northern wall. And then as the barkeep woozily falls to the floor, do we casually collect our flays as the patrons watch on in horror. It should be noted as we head outside into the main square of Nactom that many of the taverns and homes, basically cities of Nosgoth, are mostly empty or generic. However, to expedite this law play, but also sate the need to know what's behind closed doors for the curious viewer who have never experienced Blood Omen. Sometimes we will make brief stops at mostly unremarkable locales, such as the Lion's Head Pub, which inside boasts a barrel to the northeast that has a flay, and also a health potion. However, our health is already at full. And of course, there are some drowsy denizens that amble about, but we shan't disturb these bloated blood banks from their path unless we have a pressing need to drink from the precious crimson fluid. Heading north safely over the body of water across a bridge, we see an armory to the west named Nachtholm Armory. The armory itself is unremarkable save for a forge and weapons and armor that is found at any blacksmith. Except to the north wall again we find two chests that provide us with more flays. The Nactom armory contains an interesting floor mural of a shield. Given that most murals, especially those depicting power-ups or weapons were found on the floor of where the item was picked up, it could be speculated that Cain was originally meant to have gained a shield here but this was removed from the game. Outside once again, we ignore the roaming villagers heading west across a bridge and towards the King's Tavern. The tavern itself is a large hall that houses many citizens milling about. And although one could be forgiven for ignoring this tavern, as it seems as generic as the others, it actually holds a precious bounty in its northeast corner. Of all the methods I employ, this is perhaps the cruelest causing my victim's body to shrink on itself, crushing bones and rupturing organs till the pressure inside bursts the sack of fleshy skin, spraying its contents for all to see. Unable to contain our curiosity, we decided best to test a new ability to horrific effect. Exiting the tavern, we head east to the only other residence on the island. Inside are two residents, a male and a female, who own a picture of either a screaming face or the ugliest child we've ever seen. Heading to the southern island across the bridge, we then enter the most northeastern building and leave the local serfs to go about their business. Outside once more, we head to the west to the only other accessible building on the island to be greeted by a local grave digger and his wife. <laughs> As he somewhat humorously tries to defend his wife's honor with his shovel, we would leave them be, but now she will pay for his transgression. 
Once outside, we then returned to our wolf form for flight of foot, heading north outside of the village as it has been fully explored. But before we continued north to Steinschenkrow, we head west and are forced to pass through some particularly painful water as there is a bounty that lies for us up in a northern cave. Inside we see a boulder which we easily push past and step onto the crimson teleporter. Exiting the other side of the teleporter, we find ourselves in a megalith circle. Adorned with many treasures and just as many enemies, we also find the coveted time spell. At times, my magic extends into very exotic disciplines, such as the manipulation of time. I am able to slow time down so I can move about quick as a wolf, while all others move as though they were mired in mud. Again, with so many enemies about, we think it prudent we test the efficacy of this exotic spell. I would like to report that we felled our enemy at an accelerated rate while they were too slow to react. The reality is, their energy bolts could not only still hone but match our speed, and thus we were forced to flee. Back at the path just above Nactome, we head north and find ourselves entering another blood fountain. The blood of ages flows so sweet. Come drink from us. The rain will do you no harm, for our blood preserves. Although the disembodied voice promises that their blood preserves if we head back inside the cave, we find that we're not allowed a second sip of the Crimson Icor. Do not be greedy, vampire. You have had your fill. Although the Blood Fountain's mistress had claimed that Cain will be protected from the rain, we dip a toe and find that bodies of water still burn like acid. Just above us, we see signage leading to the entrance of Steinchenkrow, or as the locals have seemed to aptly nickname, Stenchenkrow. The town of Stenchenkrow bore with it the infamous aroma of its inhabitants. In life, I would not have graced the place with my presence. In death, I merely added to the stench. Despite its rampart appearance, Stenchenkrow was mainly inhabited by peasants, and many noblemen, such as Cain in life, refused to set foot there among other debauchery which we stumble upon. We first enter a large multi-room house in the southeast that bears a single implode spell. Although a total of 11 buildings were found in the township, only three buildings, one in the main square and two in the northeast square were accessible and could be entered. Indeed, perhaps the most valuable point of interest is found in the northwest of the town, in the guise of a simple man cooking called Ermok the Mad. This lunatic was delighted to see me. Perhaps his madness would reveal a greater truth. The bastards in Stenchenkrow shun me as Nozgov shuns them. I know what it means to be an outsider vampire. I fear you not. But remember this, there are others who will speak to you, so long as you know how to look. Although it is easy to dismiss the words of a madman offhand, we have the feeling his words may prove more invaluable in due time. Inside the nearby tavern, the second of three buildings we can explore, we find two flays as well as more intolerant strumpets, as Ermok had promised. Speaking of strumpets, it's then we head to the final explorable building in town, and the only one that is marked, the Bighorn Brothel. Inside the big, burlesque boardhouse, we see a publican pacing in front of a picture of a woman scantily clad, which was the fashion at the time. Up the stairs, we find an implode spell, and heading into the western room, we find another barrel as well as some, well, catty inhabitants we take care of, and discover that we are full on flays, and thus we should expend some for good measure lest the dirty denizens somehow infect us with a stench. We must admit, in our haste for revenge, we had forgotten to ask Mortanius if we were still susceptible to uh, unbecoming ailments of the flesh. 
It's in the Western Room that we find horrors of this hostel as gore is caked across the room. The word help is scrawled hastily in blood. Misery, death and decay intermingle, overwhelming our senses, and we dutifully drain the poor inhabitants, granting them a small mercy of a swift death. Heading up the central hallway, we find a large open room, and after what we witnessed, leave no survivors. <laughs> However, we can't help but notice something queer about the miscolored carpet on the northern wall. Pushing the crooked chair aside opens a secret passage, and promptly stepping on the teleporter, we find another secret spirit forge. One must be wary in dealing with the spirit forges. The wraith and shades that inhabit them offer items beyond mortal dreams in exchange for a sampling of your blood. The Wraithsmiths forge their items with forfeit souls. Shed your blood for me, and these artifacts will be yours. Imagine what power you could wield. So, you come to the Spirit Forge for help, do you, vampire? Trade your secrets for the blood of the dead, I will. We then sacrifice our precious lifeblood for a helping of implode spells. Exiting the Spirit Forge, we find ourselves just north of Stenshin Crow and south of the town of Vasabund, one step closer to Nupraptus Retreat. Heading north, our path is all but blocked to the west. To the northeast, the entrance to a small gypsy camp. The gypsies, purveyors of distrust and superstition. Most of their babble should be taken with a pinch of salt, since the gypsies often tinker with weary travellers' minds. However, a few gypsies have something interesting to say. <laughs> Dispatching the gypsy sentry, we come across this small encampment that subsists with five small tents clustered together. However, these tents are mostly empty, just as the camp is, save a few sad sentries. It's only during our exploration of the northwestern tent do we find something of value. The Disguise Form Spell. There are benefits to traveling beneath a human guise. The threat to my person is lessened and much information can be gleaned. However, the illusion is flimsy, and any act of aggression on my part can break the spell. Was this what Ermok the Mad was speaking of? Something to aid us cease hostilities and gain entry into otherwise inaccessible places, now that we know how to look. After felling the remaining gypsies that loitered about the camp, we decide then to try our hand at entering the nearby Vasabund. Vasabunt lay, its glory now stained and faded, a faithful child in the looming shadow of Nupraptor's retreat. With the promise of vengeance spurring our flight of foot, we begin to cross the bridge. An axe-wielding guard stalks us down, and we're forced to reduce him to a fine, bloody mist. However, now with an alternative to fighting and our path to Nupraptor near clear, we decided best to take advantage of the Disguise spell, becoming an indiscriminate citizen to the eyes of the local guards. Heading into the most southwestern building, we begin to explore and test the efficacy of our newest ruse. Heading up the main hall, we enter the western room where a sleeping denizen lie, to no fuss whatsoever, and he does not stir at our presence. We then head into the eastern room, collecting up spells of various sort, and realize that our ruse is fully functional, and the only way to fully test this illusion is on the guard sentry that no doubt replaced his fallen brethren, awaiting us outside. As we step into Vasabun's night air, we take a hazardous misstep into the lake without drawing suspicion and look up to see Nupraptor's retreat. Nupraptor's keep lay west of Vasabun. I would seek to cut the cancer from its heart. In the Blood Omen era, Vasabund was situated on a peninsula in a large body of water, fed by the waterfall flowing from the skull of Nupraptor's retreat, which itself flowed into the Lake of Tears. 
The buildings of the town consisted of timber-framed stone buildings with a wattle and daub walls, tiled roofs, and stone chimneys. 28 buildings, including one off to the west on the Trail of Nut Raptors, were found in the township, although only 10 were accessible. This could be seen as not literal, but instead symbolic of a larger town, and although there are many trinkets to be found in town, such as implode spells in the smithy, it is in the northern section of the town that we see a vampire's lair that is currently empty, probably due to it being nighttime, and a spell we had not encountered previously. Should this object strike an enemy, rot and decay would instantly eat their flesh and leave only a pool of blood and tissue. For a time after, the toxins are still active and therefore lethal to the touch. With the protection of the disguise spell, we continue searching the town, heading southwest and exiting towards Nupraptor's retreat. The wind carried screams from the west. I couldn't help but smile. Someone else in this world was suffering more than I. Dwelling on our macabre thought momentarily, we see that dawn has broken and we remain unmolested not just from the sun, but also the sentry guards that dwell about the town. And heading southwest, we find ourselves at a guard station. It's there we see a gate that bars our path to Nupraptor's retreat. A testament to the locals' common sense as the town had apparently once catered for pilgrims visiting Nupraptor. But with few pilgrims returning and screams drifting from the fortress, the inhabitants of the town now viewed Nupraptor as a madman and feared him rightly. Unfortunately, in our haste to confront Nupraptor, who drew ever nearer, we had broken our disguise spell and were overwhelmed by guards. At this point, we had but little choice but to return to our wolf form, relying more on speed to make a mad dash into the guardhouse, forgoing any idea of using a dialogue to bypass the gate and guards, instead heading into a small hall to manually unlock the gate via its switch. Unfortunately, we underestimated the need for opposable thumbs as the lever itself seemed to be a little more delicate than our more primal avatar could manage. With our objective successful, we flee the scene, racing around the many guards that hunt us and through the now open gate, inching ever closer to the fortress of the Mad Mentalist. The gaping moor of Nupraptor's retreat rained upon Nosgoth all his pain and misery. The disease begged to be cleansed. We then see a cave to the north of the Lake of Tears and momentarily enter it for respite and see it bears the avatar of Nupraptor, his broken visage and the promised bloody battle to come. Leaving the relative safety of the cave, we head north to the base of Nupraptor's retreat and find new dangers awaiting us. Horned skulls on the wall periodically spit fire and acid upon the ground in which we use our wolf form to leap between and gelatinous blue blobs that promise pain with their caustic touch. Taking a moment, we remark. The mentalist Nupraptor was renowned through Nosgoth for his tricks of the mind, telepathy and telekinesis. Pilgrims traveled from all across the land seeking the comfort of his lies. I sought not his wisdom, but his life. <laughs> It was said that few pilgrims returned from the retreat, and often screams and cackles were all that were heard in Vasabund, and we see the handiwork of the deranged Nupraptor. We must admit we didn't know exactly what to expect from the mentalist's retreat. We can see that there is an element of not only mind games being played with its tortured inhabitants, and we too are forced to overcome the sadistic intricacies in which have been laid before us. No doubt designed by the deranged guardian himself. Having survived the first level or gauntlet that Nupraptor prepared, we momentarily bask in the bitter irony that his own tortured pilgrims have become invaluable nourishment that aid us in persevering through this hellish trap. Dodging the many obstacles and dining on the denizens, we enter a new room that is draped in darkness 
However, our dismay is short-lived thanks to the magical light spell. Now, with the room illuminated, making our traversal of the acid pits much easier in our wolf form, bounding to the north collecting a flay and some magic, and also using an energy bolt to unlock, no doubt, another hidden recess of the maze-like fortress. Heading south, we now see that the button activated a bridge to the formerly impassable acid pit. We race then past the obstacles and arrows just as the light leaves the room and darkness seeps in. Dispatching the trio of acidic amoeba, we then feed for a final time before heading through the northern door. You dare intrude upon my sanctuary? Can I not mourn in peace? Leave, leave and let my solitude be complete. This rasping shell of a man must be none other than a guardian, not raptor. Despite his maddened pleas, he shall find no respite from our vengeance. Heading through the Eastern Hall, we realize we've made a fatal error and have not used our Illuminate spell once more as we face not raptor's cultists mired by darkness. And we find that instead of a blade, flays are much more useful. Heading north past the feast that's laid out for the priests in what appears to be a small kitchenette girt by bookshelves, we find in the northern room a final cultist. On first glance, it appears he was nothing more than a sentry or perhaps a torturer of a poor victim attached to the western wall. But moving closer to some of the shackles, we find a secret puzzle comprised of pulleys. With a hidden pattern, we must discern by pulling each chain in the correct sequence to unlock our previously barred path. Once successful, we find that the original hallway's northern door is now open to us, and heading inside, we discover more bodies and booby traps are bountiful. It's not until we head into the next room we see our progress is abruptly halted as a spiked pit that we cannot leap even with the aid of our canine claws, and once again, utilize the energy bolt spell. Heading up to the northeastern hall, as the door is barred just to the north, we find a new enemy, some form of Pied Piper that brings the dead back to life with him. And although he does not attack us, his sentries do one by one as he calls upon them. <coughs> Only by felling the fanciful fool may our journey resume. Utilizing the pulley on the northern wall, we have now opened the previously inaccessible door that we saw in the hallway. And upon entering it, we find the entire room caked in gore. And it's then we pause, commenting. The cretin squandered life and left it seeping on the floor. Such waste was a travesty. Perhaps Nup Raptor needed to be taught a lesson as to the value of blood. With Nup Raptor drawing near, we find in a final room a strange depiction of the revenants that we'd previously faced. Transforming back into human form and utilizing the energy spell, the dead rise from the ground and a demented duo of harlequins bring forth their zombie army encircling us momentarily, but we manage to escape. Finding we may have moved out of the frying pan and into the freezer. In the middle of a cavernous hall unlike any other thus far is a brain that has been painted on the ground, the symbol of Nup Raptor, and a large skull embedded in the wall to the north that is blocking our path. This room would have four pillars. Each pillar signifies a test from the mentalist. Starting with the northeastern pillar, we then move into the room to find a simple symbol of a woman screaming on the ground as the light turns black and revenants all appear to encircle us. Having dealt with their brethren before, we find that dealing with them in single file is easy enough, not even wasting any more flays as we hack at them with our sword as their bodies spew black ichor, falling one by one. Post defeating the gaggle of walking dead, we head up the darkened hallway onto a teleporter and back into Nup Raptor's quadrant of challenges. 
It's then we head to the southeastern part of the room and the second challenge. Entering the doorway, we find ourselves in a small room that is tiled and strangely lit. Behind one of the three pictures inside, we find a hidden switch which unveils a teleporter. Transported, we find ourselves in a large cavernous room. We cannot see but an inch past the claustrophobic darkness as we move off the path of the light and into the shadows. We're transported back to the picture of the woman outstretched and our journey begins anew. The puzzle itself is actually fairly straightforward. All we have to do is try and listen for the click of tiles which are on the ground, which then opens a new lit path and we rinse and repeat, never straight from the light, otherwise frustratingly, we will be transported back to the beginning of the puzzle and have to navigate its dark dimensions anew. After quite some time, we find that we have actually circled back to the original picture of the woman outstretched and find a potion awaiting us before we leave as the darkness had singed our skin. Back in the main hall, we head to the southwestern corner to attempt the third challenge. Once inside the room, we find familiar spikes and realize we must utilize our wolf form to dodge the incoming barrage of flame balls spat by the horned skulls on the walls. Now, using expert timing to dodge the spikes, we can leap to each platform safely. And at the southwestern side, we find a trial has been overcome. We then race to the northwestern corner to face the fourth and final trial. Once inside, we find familiar decorations and head up the northern hallway and stumble upon, just to the west, a slow time spell. Collecting it has awakened a duo of angry undead. <coughs> Moving past the fallen to the next room, we find a new spell entirely. However, it too is guarded by the dead. When conjured, the energy bank permits me access to mass amounts of magical energy for a brief period of time. However, when the moment passes, I will be drained of all magic, unable to cast even the simplest of spells. With the boon of a new spell in our arsenal, we leave the fourth and final trial as there were only a few lingering revenants to take care of and head inside the now opened Skull's Moor, inching one step closer to Nupraptor. Inside the next room, we find Nupraptor's priests adamant on flicking their ineffectual flame and thus we utilize our terrible flays to unburden them of their flesh. In the southern room below, while battling one of Nupraptor's acolytes and flicking switches to unlock the doors above, we see we are in the lower mandible of the skull in which his retreat sits. With our path now clear, we head to the room above and realize there is a door to the west we can enter. The room is full of flays and two of Nupraptor's acolytes. However, we have decided to save said flays and savor the moment using our blade to cut their incantations short. Heading up some stairs in the northern room, we find ourselves in the middle of the skull and entering the door to the west, we explore a concave green window we can look out of that is set into the eye socket. There, outstretched before us, lies Nosgoth in all of its glory. However, as we make our way to the right eye, we find we may have been too hasty in our assessment of Nosgoth. From the depths of the retreat's eye sockets, I viewed Nosgoth in a different fashion. The glass seemed to warp the image and taint the color. <laughs> as if Nosgoth needed assistance in making its corruption apparent. Exiting the eye, we head through a teleporter and into the top of the skull, as if to mirror Nupraptor's own mind's warped and deranged view of the world. The space itself seems to bend our own perceptions. After collecting the last of the spells, items and trinkets, it's then we head through the final teleporter and see the safety of a save point before we confront the mad mentalist Nupraptor. However, as we enter the doorway to the east, we see an unexpected ambush awaits. So, Malik, 
Have you come to fail the circle once more? Leave, Paladin. I do not need your protection. Come, Cain. Come, share my pain. As we finally confront Nopraptor and see he was protected by Malik, but instead the mentalist, angry at what he perceived as Malik's failure to defend the circle at the death of Ariel, dismissed Malik, instead welcoming his fate. And thus we stalk him to his final retreat, a lone island of stone surrounded by spikes and promised death. Approaching him, we flippantly evaluate. So, this was the mentalist Nupraptor, this broken, pathetic little man. Yet crippled as he was, he would not yield without battle. Very well, old fool. If it is death you seek, I will not deny you. As crippled as Nupraptor was, employing several illusions with his mental powers, and as we ourselves attempt to attack him with our fearsome flays, we remember that we have magical energy bolts in store. As we continue to dodge his magical spheres of death, one of the piercing purple probes hit us in the midline and shatter on impact. However, as we duck through one of his disappearing spheres, we quickly learn a magical assault is for naught and instead use our blade to pierce his putrid flesh. As the steel of our sword bites into the chair-bound bastard, we hear a scream of one of his victims in the background, almost propelling him on to change his attack. However, his obsession with skulls matches our own, as we cleave his head clean off his shoulders. All that's left to do before we leave this wretched place is claim our prize. Perhaps the head of her beloved will convince Ariel that I have accomplished my task. Stepping on a spike behind Nopraptor's sunken body as if a final farewell, we happily bid his retreat adieu and step on a teleporter that transports us into a nearby cave and we find an unfamiliar weapon enshrined in a stone circle. The mace is amongst my most useful of weapons for it merely stuns my victims, allowing me ample time to feed. Entering our weapons menu, we indeed find the mace is now equipable and destroys large stones in our path. As we move to open the near, as we move to open the nearby treasure chests, we also find that the previously inaccessible chests can be broken open with a hefty swing of our mace. With our prize of a new mace and greater health collected, we exit the cave in our bat form, opting to leverage the speed of flight to hastily return to the pillars. and Ariel, with the dearly beloved's decapitated head in hand. I placed Nupraptor's head before the Pillar of the Mind, and watched on as it dissolved into the stone. The Pillar accepted its offering. Thus, it was restored. Nupraptor was but the genesis. Forever tainted by his madness, the circle was beyond redemption. For them, absolution lay only in death. In me, they would find their deliverance. But first I had to defeat their shepherd. Malek, defender of the Nine, lay in a keep to the far north, past Vasabunt. It was time for me to test the wrath of the Pillar of Conflict. Death in the circle breathes life to the Pillars. For every pillar, there is a token. Only with these shall they be restored. But to reach a warrior, you must first breach his ward. Find Malak and destroy him. Only then will the circle fall. With the mad mentalist Nupraptor dead, and his severed head offered to the circle, his pillar appears now cleansed. And thus, 
We must stalk down our next target, the ineffectual guardian, Malik. The pillar of conflict, protected by the paladin Malik. With the circle's second servant now in our sights, we once again resume our bat form and take flight towards Malik's impenetrable bastion. We arrive at the northeastern end of Vasabund, and in front of us see a previously barred path by two stone pillars. Make short work of them, thanks to our new weapon, the powerful mace. Again, we see sigils and stones try and block our path. Regardless, we come upon two sentries that bear sword and shield and boast fighting prowess like no other, pushing us on the back foot towards Vasabund. It's only after felling the first foe and draining him of his precious lifeblood do we happen upon the second and realize the folly of our ways. The mace is best utilized with two quick consecutive strikes and thus stuns our enemies, exposing their supple throats, begging to be drank deeply. With the third century, we easily dispatch him thanks to our newfound technique but not before heading to a cave just to the north. The blood of ages flows so sweet. Come drink from us. Your magic energy recovers more quickly, for our blood enhances. Exiting the cave with our newly found magical perk, we find the guards have resumed their patrol anew. And as such, a push to the southeast on the back foot, fighting off one sentry before destroying another pillar and the guard that hides quite a collection of artifacts, including flays and hearts of darkness. A welcome addition to our arsenal for the battle of blood and steel, no doubt promised when facing the Paladin Malik. Years ago, word reached us of a strange pestilence that had laid siege to a few remote villages far east, but the rumors failed to prepare us for the horror that was the plague. So then we realized perhaps the pillars were not to keep us out, but instead to desperately contain this plague. Worms and maggots fed upon his festering skin. The scent of tainted blood seeped through the wounds upon which they feasted. Pity. Such a waste. Good blood gone bad. And we thought the smell and stench and cry was formidable. Corhagen, my home, the finest city in all of Nosgoth, rich in vanity and conceit. I had no delusions as to the welcome I would receive. Wary, we see bodies scattered about, infected with the plague. Entering the first building, we find a vampire coven had set up shop, or at least two coffins. Perhaps as they were empty, they fled due to the plague and lack of fresh blood. However, the full breadth of the horrors we witness is almost incomprehensible as a cart of the deceased, bodies overflowing, lay abandoned in the street, a morbid promise of things to come. Death and disease stalked these streets. Bodies lay most in the very spots in which fate had taken them. A perfect homecoming. The local denizens that meet us don't even look in our direction as if they have enough trouble on their plate. Perhaps worse yet, one of the Harlequin Pied Pipers plays its flute, bringing forth more of the dead in broad daylight as he happily marches behind us, as we're forced to answer his necrotic song with the torrent of energy bolts. However, we must confess the last of the undead does not fall so easily, and we begin to question the efficacy of our mace against the recently re-risen. <laughs> Heading just to the north, we find an empty dwelling save for two dead bodies that lay limp on the ground. And then to the west, the building adjacent boasts a similar scene, save for a single barrel against the northern wall, which bequeaths us a single heart of darkness. Heading outside, we quickly realize entering buildings respawns enemies. Congruently, so have our necrotic friends. Leveraging deception over full frontal force, we once again employ the disguise spell, 
heading past the Harlequin uninterrupted and into the Repel Dungeon, the first of three found in Corhagen. Heading through the western door, we find our disguise spell does not aid us as we had once hoped. Forced against the back wall, we dodge biting blade and crushing mace alike, all the while slipping between arrows. In the room above, we find ourselves in a similar predicament as a trio of cutthroats stalks us down. Pressing forward, we quickly discover we have also pressed our luck too far with the disguise spell, forced to resume our vampiric form and fight our way out of the cacophony of weapons as they close in. <laughs> with darkness seeping into the corners of our vision. The heart of darkness. And it's only thanks to the heart of darkness our life has been spared momentarily. With our attackers still in full force, we begin to dodge and weave between them, drinking deep from the life-giving blood of the heart. It seems, facing Malik's minions, the guardian of conflict, that there is no dodging battle, but instead, Embrace conflict entirely. Stalking down our victims, we employ the many flays at our disposal, rending flesh from bone and savoring their screams with undue glee. <laughs> heading south, we find ourselves back in the main hall that we started, and now heading east, the undead return to bar our path and the many physical traps that impede us, becoming more numerous the more we travel. Heading through a western door, we find more sorcerers hurling their accursed energy bolts, and realize that close quarters we perhaps cannot dodge them, and thus we shift back into our wolf form, attempting to feed but still being struck by the many projectiles. Our best hope at survival is making a mad dash through the rest of the room, once we have come nearly full circle, we locate the promised Repel Spell card. Invoking this spell cloaks me under a protective aegis. Whatever spell is cast at me will be reflected back at the caster, leaving me unharmed. It will only last for a short time, however, before leaving me vulnerable once more. Testing our latest spell, indeed we are encapsulated inside a magical barrier and heading into the southern room quickly discover that the sorceress whose energy bolts had plagued us so much, now harmlessly deflected, turning our own defensive desire into a formidable offense. As we exit the dungeon and back into the rotting remnants of the town, it should be noted that in development, the Repel Dungeon was one of the areas that was known to have undergone significant changes. It was not originally used to house the Repel spell in the Alpha, but instead for two deleted spells, Force Shield and Magic Absorb, with an entirely different Repel Dungeon present later in the Alpha. By the time of Beta, however, this had changed, and entries found in a second developer's level select in the Alpha could suggest that there were originally three separate separate dungeons for Force Shield, Magic Absorb, and Repel, which were gradually consolidated. Inside one of the unmarked taverns, we find four items in barrels. Keeping with the town's aesthetic, the tavern's inhabitants are littered about, and as we leap behind the bar, we see not even the publican or his wife survived the deadly plague. Outside, under the commoner's disguise once more, we head to the northeast and find another empty domicile. The residents housing a stack of rotting corpses and a single flay for us to collect. Crossing the thoroughfare outside and to the east, we enter another unmarked building. Its residents, though, are alive, or in a manner of speaking, as we realize these are the dark priests that we had encountered previously. However, they too are fooled by the disguise spell, and moving through the northeastern door of what appears to be some form of church, we then find another save point and respite before we head deeper into this darkened, unknown dungeon. It's a few rooms to the north, we discover a painting of Cain marking the ground, wearing a formidable plate of necrotic armor. This, of course, denotes the Bone Armor Dungeon. As we head inside, we're set upon by two skeletons, and by pressing a switch on the northern wall, we escape their assault unscathed and can head through the northern door. However, 
we find something peculiar floating towards us. Unsure of the shadows on the ground and their meaning, humanoid wraiths slash at us from the blackened puddles. We can only imagine what type of abyss had spawned them. Thankfully, with enough damage, they dissipate in a scream. <laughs> In a room just above, as we dodge more of the Shadow Dwellers, we find a new obstacle. Ice that adds unwanted momentum underfoot. Superficially, this seems innocuous enough. Experience has taught us that in time, our opinion of this will surely change for the worse. Dodging more spirits to hit a switch on the northern wall, we drink deep from another victim, but are then pressed against said wall, barely able to see what we're fighting thanks to a bony umbrella above. Now moving under the archway to the east, five more undead block our path, and we wonder, when will we find respite from these hordes of the undead? <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't appear anytime soon. Crossing paths with a garishly garbed, hovering skeleton summoner, the source of these unrelenting shades. In return, we gift the summoner a flurry of energy bolts that tear his being apart. In an equally showy plume of viscera and death. Weary from our constant battle with the undead, we resume our wolf form forced to face a deluge of spikes, whether from the wall or placed haphazardly underfoot, only our leap saving us from the searing spears. However, we have just moved from the frying pan and into the freezer. As our wolf form had gifted us more speed, the added dexterity now works against us as ice adding momentum underfoot means we slide into barbed death that surrounds us. Thankful for the reprieve with the bevy of beauties that gift us their blood, through an eastern door there is another summoner. This time of the skeletons that stalk us down, we try in vain to scratch our way through the northern door and exit the room, realizing that we must face them in combat if we are to resume our journey. That goes for the Sordid Summoners too, who erroneously believed they were safe on their spiked perch, but there's nothing a few flays won't fix. The room to the north bears a peculiar ornamental design embedded in the floor. More skulls than we can care to count and looks to be a gateway for the undead. Bay Victor! Bay Victor! <laughs> Exhausted from the sheer onslaught of undead, in the room above is the promised bone armor card. Before collecting it, we somewhat wisely light up our surroundings in case our pilfering of the artifact disturbs more undead. Lower forms of undead fall swiftly to deception. With the bone armor, they are not as eager to challenge me. They more than a little eager for a reprieve from the onslaught, we equip the bone armor, only to be nearly savaged by the remaining ghoul. However, as we enter the next room to the south, we find that the shades are somewhat pacified. Testing said armor on the next batch of wandering skeletons, they too dismiss us, passive in their patrol. To the south, as we pussyfoot over a block of ice, the remaining skeleton all but ignores us exiting the dungeon and welcomed by piles of corpses again. We resume our other disguise, this time for the living. We make our way to the closest open building to the north and find more corpses in a main dining area. To the east, we then discover another painting on the floor, this time a villagers being destroyed by the plague. Opening the barrels above, we find out why. This cleanses my body of any dangerous poisons. Quite useful with all the filth I find myself surrounded by. Making our way downstairs, we find that the spirits have lease. However, due to our new bone armor, the ethereal maidens largely leave us unmolested. While searching the various rooms, we find a new item to add to our repertoire. A medley of death and evisceration. Let fate choose my enemy's demise. After unlocking the previously barred northern door, we take the teleporter, 
into Corhagen's third and final dungeon, which is aptly named Inspire Hate. As we hunt the Paladin of Conflict, we so see a sigil on the ground of two swords clashing, a promise of the potential power we can find inside. But first, we must take care of the errant guard that wields a scimitar that extends as if it was a polar, Making bridging the gap with our mace nigh impossible, we instead fall back on one of our infamous flays. Heading through the northwestern room in our disguised form, we decide perhaps subterfuge is not our greatest ally in the dungeon of conflict itself and see a large room full of guards ambling about. As we send the stairs past the Inspire Hate mural, the spikes that had previously divided us from our enemies all but disappear. This spell allows me to exploit the petty prejudices of man. Minor grievance would escalate to murderous rage, and oh, the sweet terror when the spell wore off and they saw their hands covered with their neighbor's blood. With the way that Kane sells it, we would be fools to not test out this hate-fueled magic, heading to the east and west and stirring up the polearm-bearing guards. With the hornet's nest stirred successfully, we unleash the spell on our enemies, and chaos ensues. <laughs> We didn't realize just how effective the Inspire Hate spell would be, and after the guards have dealt with the undead, their unhinged bloodlust is turned on one another. All the while, we're free to skirt past them unimpeded. And although there are several more rooms inside said dungeon that allow us to test this ability, we must continue our quest to hunt down the Paladin Malik. And so we exit the dungeon and find ourselves in another plague-filled residence in the eastern side of Corhagen. Emerging outside, we pause a moment to have a much needed drink from one of the healthy blood bags ambling about. <laughs> Heading north, exiting Corhagen and the pervasive plague, we find the forest itself opens up, presenting the base of a mountain. To the east is the Termagant Forest. However, our pathway is blocked by thick trees and shrubbery, and so we leverage our lupine form, bounding up the mountain and finding a bat flight point as a view of our enemy ahead. Malik's Bastion, perched defiantly on the mountaintop, black as night against the blanket of snow. What manner of man would choose a land so harsh and utterly devoid of life? With no way to scale the mountain by foot, we take flight in our bat form. Arriving at Malik's sterile fortress, we find the main doors are open as if the paladin awaits our arrival, and so fleeing the frigid cold, we enter to an ominous warning. I know you are here, demon. The stench of death clings to you. Just ahead, we collect a heart of darkness while remarking. The interior was as cold and sterile as the snow outside with empty suits of armor and sharp, cruel steel lining the walls. Indeed, Kane's appraisal of the tower is wholly accurate. The Paladin Malik being the aspect of conflict is in favor of sword and steel, spike and death and all manner of physical harm. Exploring the fortress to the west, we find a much needed save point. Exiting to the main area and unlocking the eastern door, dodging one of the Blades of Death, our trials to overcome Malik's gauntlet begin in earnest. It should be noted that Malik's fortress is indeed 90% spiked pits, floating spiked balls of death, and swinging axes that generally are looking to eviscerate Kane, and thus we will be skipping most of it due to the fact that it's highly repetitive and, well, painful for all parties involved. 
Speaking of painful, we happen upon one of Malik's many sentries, this time some form of knight that wields a sword and is highly resistant to our new spiked mace, and they're not even able to be stunned by the new weapon. And so, dutifully, we fling energy bolts at our new foes until they explode in a plume of flesh. <laughs> they vict us indeed. Exiting the room through a northern door and collecting a blue energy ball which will aid with our shocking spell. We find ourselves in the next room of note set upon by a duo of knights. Realizing that they physically have the upper hand and there's too many to contend with with our energy bolts alone, we hastily decide to allow the death card spell to decide our enemy's fate. With our foes now a fine dust on the ground, we pause to take inventory of our surroundings and see. The large room houses a strange machine in its center and a glowing orb that seems to be its power source, and instinctually know it must be destroyed. The globe powered the machinery. With its destruction, the deafening shrieks of the machine ceased to echo throughout the bastion. It was now time to silence the machine's maker. You try my patience, fledgling. Care to try my blade instead? Exiting Malik's main tower, we find ourselves back outside between the snowy ramparts. Heading west across the frozen tundra, we find two sentries outside of the second tower and remark. The guards at the gate offered no resistance. They were frozen solid, and dead as they stood, their flesh welded to the cold metal of their armor. My eyes yearned from lack of contrast. My mouth ached for want of blood. In this cold wasteland, food was scarce, and my hunger grew. Making our way to the second tower, as we head inside, we're confronted with a gruesome sight. A corpse held court on a tattered throne, grinning malignantly at me through blackened teeth. It is not often that a man sees his own corpse. It is a sobering experience. But I am far less interested in my own corpse than I am in yours. Prepare yourself, vampire! With Malik's corpse thoroughly through with his empty threats, or should I say hollow, like his bones, we head through the western teleporter and find a litany of items housed in four chests. A welcomed boon for the battle to come. Teleporting back into the main hall and crossing paths with Malik's corpse once more, we then venture through the eastern teleporter and see a much needed save shrine awaits. With our wounds healed, we steal our resolve heading through the northern door past two more sentries into a long hall lined with armor. And it's there Malik waits to meet us in battle. Bay Victus! <laughs> Not unlike Malik's lesser guardians, our mace once again bounces off his armor, and as it is hollow, it does not stun him whatsoever. Frustrated, we begin to back up and look for alternative routes, flinging barbed flays at his metal carapace to no avail as they pass harmlessly through. Sensing Malik, the aspect of conflict demands an honest duel. We switch back to our sword to great effect. Bay Victus! With the succession of successful swipes, four to be precise, we knock Malik back and he grunts in pain. Knocked back for a third time, Malik falls helplessly to the floor. Oh, so we thought. Once reassembled, Malik resumes his attack, now with renewed vigor and a new element. <laughs> Well, it seems in Malik's desperation, he's not above utilizing projectiles. However, we are not without our own defenses. Both Malik's physical and energy attacks are deflected away harmlessly, and we resume our own barrage with our blade. <laughs> Succumbing to our onslaught, Malik falls again for a final time, and we believe ourselves the victor, somewhat 
Prematurely, the air around us begins to crackle with energy that Malik draws into himself as he emanates a rolling tidal wave of concussive power that would kill us on our feet, and it tears apart the suits of armor that stand on the floor, forcing us to flee into the teleporter and away from certain death. This concludes our battle with the Guardian of Conflict, for now. Havoc and malice, their presence in my hands keeps me from employing magic. Yet rest assured, they do little to hamper my relish for slaughter. With newfound weapons in hand, we leave the confines of Malik's Bastion in search for a new means of revenge. After battling Malik, who, in his desperation, summoned a concussive wave of death that forces to flee mid-fight. We find ourselves outside his stronghold atop a snowy cliff and remark. Twould seem Malik's destiny with my blade was postponed. Perhaps Ariel could offer further guidance. With the bat beacon just to our east, we take flight once more to the Pillars of Nosgoth to interrogate the fallen guardian and perhaps learn our next steps. Ah, the Lord returns empty-handed. Does the Seraphim elude you? Very well, go east of Malak's Bastion. The Oracle shall give you aid. With little recourse but to heed the Guardian's advice, we find ourselves atop the cliff once more. However, a tree bars our path. Utilizing one of our two new axes, we easily lop it down and find a bandit whose limbs could also use a nice lopping. Heading east, we immediately take pause, finding a group of bandits lying in wait, flinging projectiles in our direction. However, we are not without defenses, or should I say, offense. The dual axes are formidable against multiple enemies, as long as Cain is not interrupted. However, he sacrifices defense and the ability to cast spells while using them. Heading east in the next area, we find a sign pointing us towards the Termogen Forest. The snow turning into thin, slippery blankets underfoot, and we get a better vantage point of the Oracle's lair. High upon the face of these cliffs, hidden amongst the complex network of caves, the underground sanctity of the wise Oracle of Nosgoth lay sleeping. Perhaps it was time to brave the winds and seek out this oracle from the vantage point of the heavens. With naught to guide us but a shining light peeking out of the cliffside, we return once more to our lupine form to begin our scramble up the mountain. But not before a familiar disembodied voice echoes within our skull. Oh, little vampire, the game grows interesting. But with so many pawns, can you find the true player? Pondering on Mortanius's taunts, we leap across the lake and see to the east a gypsy camp, and to the north, an open cave that we cautiously explore. Inside, we find marked on the ground a familiar mural painted, this time denoting the Shrine of Stun. However, as the picture depicts a man being stunned, we quickly discern that this cave is probably full of bandits and re-enter utilizing our disguise spell. Dodging several bandits, we find ourselves in a northern room. It's patrolled by a single sentry, sauntering safely atop his perch. Gathering the stun spell, Kane remarks. The human mind is a fragile thing. One minor shock properly timed can render them catatonic and ripe for feeding. With the shrine spell now ours, we attempt to leave via the northern door and find it blocked, and thus we must contend with the sentry. However, as previously suspected, our axes cannot reach him atop his perch. As we're unable to utilize our new stun spell, we have to unequip our axes. <laughs> Instead of stunning him with our weapon, he is immediately free to feed upon thanks to the stun spell. With our newfound arcane power at our fingertips and our bloodlust sated, 
we prefer to amble out of the cave, forgoing unnecessary violence in lieu of hunting down the oracle and answers to the riddle of our true enemy's identity, with Mortanius's taunt plaguing our thoughts. Heading to the east, we then move through the gypsy camp unaccosted. Unlike the previous camp, these tents cannot be entered and therefore should be circumvented. In fact, there's not really anything except a couple of wandering blood bags, and thus we head to the cave just to the east. Inside, more bandits meander about, and the disguise spell really does its job. Should be commended for its ability to hide us in plain sight. Wandering through the cave system, we see the bandits' enemies affixed to the walls, bound to the rock and left to an icy fate. Once outside, we then resume our wolf form and scrabble up a small ledge to the east, and it should be noted that this cave-like system, if it seems familiar, is reminiscent of Zelda 2, which had its own Death Mountain caves in which you had to explore a maze-like structure, and as maddening as it is, this cave also boasts a similar layout. Although it is somewhat easier to figure out where you're going, there is just a lot of unnecessary searching and backtracking. Once outside the cave and heading up to the north, we find ourselves in another blood fountain. The blood of ages flows so sweet. Come drink from us. The snow will do you no harm, for our blood preserves. Now protected from the harmful ice, we can begin our exploration of the cave system anew, searching for the Oracle's lair. In the final cave system, we find no meaningful reprieve from the maze's madness, and wandering through the icy halls, we're then confronted with a disgusting, gelatinous, earth-formed guardian as it hurls its putrid projectiles and spewing green icor when hit with our mace. Though they do not fall so easily, attempting to leverage our latest spell, Stun, to no avail. Mentally noting its ineffective nature on the globby matron, we then switch tactics to trusty energy blasts. <laughs> Later, as we head north through the icy cave network, dodging the now all too familiar traps of arrows flung in our direction and spikes underfoot, we encounter a new enemy, a being afflicted with lycanthropy. However, instead of our own wolf form, they bear a white coat. <laughs> In a misguided attempt to make peace with our familiar furry friend, we too shift into our wolf form to no avail, but instead remember our latest weapon, the dual axes that heft through its hide as it howls like a charm. <laughs> We then attempt to break down an ice pillar in front of us with a similar move to no avail as we only chip at the ice and are forced to switch back to our familiar crushing mace which shatters the icicle, revealing its contents inside for us to collect. Trudging our way through the cave, we finally find reprieve from the maddening maze with a save point and exiting the room just to the north, we find ourselves in an unfamiliar, almost museum or trophy room. Examining the contents of the room in a clockwise motion, we first approach what appears to be Malik's fallen armor and remark. Odd. This armor resembled that of the ward and his minions, yet the steel seemed newly fashioned and untarnished by time. I recognize this crest from my youth. Tis the sigil of the mighty lion of Willendorf, bloodstained and rusted upon this battered shield. Crossing the room past a broken mirror, which makes about as much sense to us as the other items, we see another shield on the wall with a differing crest. The shield was newly crafted. Its metal shone brightly in the firelight. The crest I did not recognize. And to the south we find a macabre trophy indeed, as a guillotine, still bloody, stands proudly in the southwestern corner of the room. A guillotine, its blade still wet with blood. We finally decide to read the tome sitting atop a pedestal. Hopefully we can gain some insight into the history and origin of these bizarre items. 
Hidden amidst the many obscure artifacts in that museum, I discovered an ancient chronicle. This passage caught my eye. It was during these dark times, infested with the plague of the undead, that the Circle brought the Seraphan to existence. Trained to be devoutly loyal to the Circle and the perfect exterminators of the undead scourge, they were led to many victories by the righteous paladin, Malek, protector of the pillar of conflict. They cleansed the vampires with fire and released their souls to more blessed realms. There is no wrath as terrible as that of the righteous. I'd read enough. At once, disgusted and intrigued, I placed the book back down in that museum. Learning of the curator's obsession with the Seraphim and their own crusade against our vampiric kin, we head through the northern door and find, perhaps, the owner of said items, the Oracle themselves. A nobleman, seeking wisdom, death has taught you well. Enough philosophy, I seek answers. Answers, indeed. I have them all if you have the questions. And what are the questions for these answers? King Atman, the only hope to defeat the legions of the Nemesis. King Atman, paralyzed by his princess's malaise. King Atman, the useless. Pray, good sir, what are the questions? A pox upon your tricks and babble, old man. Answer me this. Who is Malik, and how can I defeat him? All in time, Sirrah. Yes, time. Unless you master it, it will master you. And now it's time for your answer. Malik, defender of the Nine, and last of the Seraphim Sorcerer Priests, his vanity led to the slaughter of the Circle at the hands of the vampire Vorador. For his failing, his spirit was fused to a hellish set of magical armor. He has allowed no member of the Circle to fall since. What of this Vorador? Follow the glow of the Ignis Fatuous to the Termagant Forest. Ignis Fatuous? The Ignis Fatuous lights the path to hell, nobleman. Your path. Time, Kay. Next time. The Oracle leaving us with more questions than when we entered. What they mean, though, we don't know. I guess only time will tell. Maddeningly, we're now led down yet another path. And perhaps to learn how to slay Malik. But also, he mentioned the path to hell. Grim tidings indeed. As we exit out of the cave, we find now a new... A doorway to the east is now open, and a new spell available to us. Collecting it, we find. Through this magic, I can stop my enemies in their tracks. Frozen in time, they can do nothing to hinder their own doom. Sometimes, I draw out their fate, for the added fear sweetens their blood. With our new magic acquired, we exit the cave to the south and find a quite formidable brute minding his business. Unfortunately, we have a new spell to test, and we find the brute indeed is held in place, allowing us to deal with him as we please, savouring his death as he falls back slowly into his inevitable demise. <coughs> And so our quest begins anew, this time to hunt down Vorador, the vampire, and learn what the Oracle had meant about a path to hell. Exiting the Oracle's cavernous dwelling, we resolve to locate the vampire Vorador, stopping only to feed on a wandering gastropod and regain our strength in the process, and pausing to ponder if Vorador will indeed see us as kin and aid us in felling the Hollow Knight Malik as he had previously, or perhaps bemusedly attack us with his undoubtedly formidable combat prowess as an unwanted interloper as we had this poor blood bag. Heading south along the trail, the very flora turns hostile, spitting spiked barbs in contempt of our unwanted trespassing. 
dispatching another of the lurid lupine that laconically stalk us neath the harsh light, we head east to locate another helpful bat flight point. Following the muddy trail back west, we find a sign labelled Ustenheim. However, as our flays disintegrate the matted fur of the lingering wolf's pack members, we see our path is utterly barred by an impassable body of water. How Malik's brethren would visit him remains but a mystery, yet as we find a nearby perch to view the black forest in which his fortress lies, we further ponder aloud. The black forest reigned here, its kingdom rarely invaded by those that live in the light. But it was called home by this mysterious Vorador. Legend told of a time when Vorador defeated Malek of the Seraphan. If such a man did exist, then he could perhaps be the key to defeating the ward. It's only as we backtrack momentarily do we see a dilapidated tower's entrance that bars our path and is impassable thanks to the thick trunks of local pines. However, with dual axes in hand, we twirl gracefully as a masculine ballerina through butter, revealing the entrance now opened anew. Inside the dank tower, we briefly head to the western room, which bears a save point. However, back in the main hall, we find the mist spell before an impassable door and comment. When in mist form, I am invulnerable to physical weapons, blade and claw. I can seep through locked doors and cracks and move swiftly like a shadow fleeing light. Entering the mist form, we find the barricaded door less than impassable as we manage to seep through the gates on its side. We casually step over the otherwise treacherous quicksand and find that physical weapons, much to our delight, pass through us as our enemies impotently slash at us. Although as we leave the dungeon, it should be noted energy projectiles can still pierce our vanishing veil and must be respected accordingly. As night falls, our power grows, and we skirt the body of water once more, feeling its searing kiss on our lower legs. Shift seamlessly into mist form. Now, light as air itself, we dance upon the water's surface, not breaking even its structure as we glide unharmed to the other side of the lake. Dodging the foul plumes of green, noxious gas of the mutant plants that lie on the other side, we move south to the darkened forest below. It's there the blackened brambles cause us much pain when we stray from the path. It's then we think back on the oracle's words. Follow the ignis fatuus, he said, or willow the wisp in the old tongue. Ironic, light shall guide a vampire to their salvation. We then see that returning to our mist form allows us to bypass the bushes' barbs completely, and we head east, stepping over their gnarled branches until we locate the entrance to one of three dilapidated forts that gift us abilities necessary for the treacherous road ahead. Inside, we see a painting of a sword surrounded by a fiery red on the floor. To the northwest, a door opens to reveal a save point. Heading back into the main foyer and the middle red double doors, the sandy surface below pulsates with a strange heat and light. The only inhabitants of the queer halls are victims left shackled to the walls, as if making sure our thirst is slaked for some kind of unknown trial ahead. <laughs> Drinking deeply, we emerge to the south and find ourselves atop a great temple's roof, yet somehow we remain underground. Hearing the familiar voices of bandits abound, we re-equip our dual axes and make short work of the lackeys. <laughs> <laughs> Realizing we are but at a disadvantage, mired by darkness, we leverage artificial light to illuminate our path. To the southeast, we then find a single glyph that glows red, one of many that must be activated to unlock the prized puzzle therein. As we move north, a female undead thrall lunges towards us, and it is only due to our superior footwork that we survive. 
Hastening our unlocking of the glyphs, we encircled the rooftop, finding glyphs and felling foul foes alike until finally the secret is laid bare and at the southernmost point we collect the promised flame sword. The sword ravages flesh with teeth of metal and flame, leaving only scorched remains. Victus! The sword, when swung, lights up the room in an eerie display of raw, fiery death. As we move to exit the temple, another vampire attempts to lunge at us once more. The dance now replaced with our steadfast swing of the sword, which lights the ground about her. Her body then combusts upon contact, and we hear her bellowing scream. The only drawback we find with this weapon being there's nothing left of our victims to feed upon, save scattered flakes of ash and contempt left in our wake. <coughs> Once outside, we head a short while west and stumble upon the second shrine of Control Mind. Inside, we appropriately see a mural of a brain shrouded by magic on the floor. The shrine innards boast many enemies flanking us on either side, though perched too high above us to do any real harm. Racing directly up the guts of the tower, we locate the promised spell and remark. This spell allows me to enslave my enemies, giving me control of their bodies. When I release my grip, their bodies will shrivel and die as I displace their souls and replace them with my own. It's then, as we turn to leave, we also utilize the spell on a trio of brigands. This gives us access to our enemies' abilities, and we can use their previously inaccessible position to unlock doors and items, as our body is protected safely below. Finally, before we explore the forest further for Vorador's hidden abode, we cross the thorny branches to the southwest and enter the Blood Gout Dungeon. Inside, we see a mural of a poor peasant having their blood ripped unceremoniously from their body. Stalking down the few enemies that dare bar our path, we soon find out why. In the next room, we see enemies flank us again and collect the Blood Gout spell explaining aloud. This spell allows me to use blood from my own body as a weapon. When struck, my enemy's blood would flow from their bodies to fill me with life. Tis a risk, yet the rewards are a temptation. Attempting to stalk down a nearby victim to our right, we momentarily forget about the burning liquid underfoot. <clears throat> Cursing our carelessness, we then take advantage of the perfect opportunity to use said spell at a distance on the poor wretch shackled to the wall. With the secrets of all three dungeons plumbed and the forest amply explored, we follow the trail to Vorador's mansion that winds to the southeast. Peppered with magical projectiles from our enemies and pursued relentlessly by undead foes, our magic stores begin to wane, and we cannot help but wonder what compelled Vorador to inhabit this treacherous marsh. Strange that Vorador would choose a dwelling so perilous to him. The swamp could only offer a vampire hazard and pain. Vorador's keep was hidden deep within the turbulent forest, nestled among vines and creepers that clung desperately to its dark weathered stone. Relinquishing our mist form for the final time, we returned to flesh on Vorador's doorstep, seeing no expense was spared on the vampire's sprawling abode as we enter its majestic doors. Stepping inside Vorador's lavish entrance, the walls we see are dripping with gold artifacts and trim to match. The floor, a blood red, bearing the visage of Vorador. The luxury with which this Vorador surrounded himself was impressive. His wealth would shame the haughty nobles of my former court. Resuming our quest, we search first to the east, locating a safe point. To the north, through the double doors, we see the breadth of Vorador's domain and comment. That this vulgar display of fortune remained undisturbed was a testament of fear's dominion over greed. With the western door barred, we move to the eastern room, finding a floating thrall ready to pounce. Burning the flame-haired hag where she hovered, we step over her ashy corpse casually to control the mind of another of Vorador's pets and use the switch on the northern wall to unlock the door to our right before remarking. 
Their charms were almost visible through the gauze of their clothing, yet beauty such as theirs delivered only death. For these were Voridor's pets, nothing more than beasts, slave to his will and the easy prey he provided. Vampires, all of them, held in thrall by one stronger still. Fending off a throng of thralls, first with our flaming sword, the second with a fiendish flame. <laughs> We find the ladies of the house were caught mid-snack and help ourselves to the pantry of the master of the house. A vampire's feast. Like cattle awaiting slaughter, men and women dangled from the rusted hooks upon the dungeon walls. Blood and viscera frosted the dirt and stone. The abundance nearly overwhelmed me, for blood is the life. In a room to the west, we find ourselves in a similar scenario. A scantily clad thrall moves to attack us, but we, in turn, attempt to dispatch the wicked wench with our sword, which swats harmlessly through the air that lies in her stead. Sensing our disadvantage, we hurl a telekinetic bolt of command across the spikes to her dagger-throwing accomplice. A body now cocooned safely in a magical barrier, the witch's fury is felt as she impotently eats one shuriken after another, succumbing finally to her wounds as we casually then flip the switch to the next room, and accordingly return to our familiar form, collecting the new demonic chaos armor. My enemies are quite vicious, and the chaos armor extracts from them a heavy price for their bloodlust. The blows are meant for me, but it is their bodies that carry the wounds. With our new thorny hide of protection, we confidently stalk our way through the rest of the now repetitive traps. We find a wicked spell in the northern room awaits our arrival. Oh, to bathe in the blood of others. This spell is especially useful in the face of multiple combatants. Beware those with tainted blood. After feeding deeply, we step through another northern door, this time to a horrific sight. Bodies in various states of agony and death, almost an artistic expression of the vampires. The room I had entered had but one purpose. The torture and execution of human beings for the sadistic pleasure of its engineer. Blood was splattered on every surface, coating the spikes that jutted from the walls and filming the stone floor. The dread and agony of victims past still echoed through the lethal walls. A symphony of terror and agony filled the air. Then, from amidst the cacophony of screaming souls, came the perverse laughter of the vampire himself. And upon the wall, scribbled in blood, were the words, Manus Seller Die. Only by partaking in the carnage do we prove our worth and the doors inexplicably open. In a western room, after cutting down another underling, we discover a tome that shares secrets of Vorador's vampiric heritage. Amongst Vorador's possessions, I found an ancient chronicle. Long ago, vampires grew in such number so as to capture the attention of the circle. The Order of the Saraphan, or the Angels of Light as they were called, was instated to counter the menace. Thus, the Vampire Purge began. Unable to travel forth, we've controlled the mind of an unfortunate adversary who allows us to stroll through the mansion and explore its secrets. In the room to the west, we see Vorador has a particular taste in paintings. The tapestries wove a tale of chaos ignited, an orgy of fire and pain. Undead beings with rotted skins caked with sulphur and ash beckoned at me through a burning abyss. Their tortured stares were a testimonial to the price of weakness. Their fate would not find me, yet blood calls to blood. The peasant proves quite useful as we puppeteer his body to a northern wall and unlock our final barred entry to Vorador himself.
we find just north as we step through the ostentatious halls of the mansion into a somberly lit room with a safe point. Entering the northwestern door, we find ourselves at the southern point of a long dining table. At the other side, the unmistakable visage of Vorador appears, beckoning us to him. As we approach him, we see something unexpected. The destiny in which we've inherited. In the bowels of that black forest, I found something worse than hell. A vision of what I was becoming. It's not often I see one of our own, especially one as young and foolish as yourself. Nonetheless, drink. Drink deep and indulge your gift. Gift? <laughs> Vorador thought my curse a blessing. That we were gods. That mortals offered their blood as sacrifice so that we could enjoy our supernatural powers. And somewhere, deep inside my new self, I knew he was right. That mortal dreams were prayers. Prayers to us, begging us for power. I pondered this as the decadent old fool prattled on about his past. A boorish account of how he defeated Malek of the Seraphim and took his vengeance upon the Circle of Nine for supporting the Seraphim Holy War to exterminate Malek! us. Feast on your corpses! After slaughtering six of the sheep, I defeated their pathetic little shepherd, Malik. Since then, our kind has not bothered with the cattle, except to feed. And I suggest you do the same. Meddling with the affairs of man can do us no good. Seraphan witch hunts are much too tedious to concern ourselves with. Am I understood, Cain? Good. Take this ring. If you ever need assistance, it will summon you. Despite your youthful arrogance, you amuse me, Kay. It would be such a pity to lose you to the abyss. Now be gone! brief meeting with the vampire Vorador in his mansion, we gifted his ring to summon him in a battle against his old foe, the guardian of conflict, Malik. Collecting the bloody bladed ring, we comment on the vampire's state. My visit with Vorador only strengthened my resolve. His power uncontested by mortals, he had fallen to another enemy. Decadence has claimed itself many a great warrior. Exiting the keep, we then say. And so I left that place, with clear knowledge of what sort of monster I would become if I let my curse consume me, and with an ally for the future.
Seeing to the east a path barred by forest, we travel along the western path finding ourselves at a bat flight point. A perfect time to learn more of our enemies by visiting the former guardian of balance, Ariel. The spirit greets our arrival, questioning. Does your patience with the Seraphim grow thin, vampire? Dogs come only when their masters call. I believe some members of the Circle have banished themselves north. Perhaps Dark Eden is the snare you seek. Ariel told me then that the easiest way to find Malik was to force his hand. The Ward was sworn to defend the members of the Circle, and so if one of the Circle was threatened, Malik would appear to protect them. She spoke of an unholy union between three of the wizards of the Circle, and directed me to their dark Eden. Curious that a trio of the Circle would gather at this so-called Eden, but we can only shudder at what paradise would look like under the deranged guidance of the Pillar's protectors, now maddened by the death of their kin, Nupraptor. Returning to the outer cave of Vorador's mansion and clearing our path, we soon see the horror the trio have conjured in the distance. A triad congregates at the roof of the world, Cain. A plot to twist the land to shape the world. North is where your vengeance lies. With the rocky terrain ahead, we resume our wolf form, bounding over ledges and towards our quarry. To the northwest, we find our path is all but blocked, and dispatching the meandering canine lupus, we move east and into the infamous town of Ustenheim, remarking. In my travels, I learned much about the legend of Janos Audrin. Here in this quaint pastoral village of Ustenheim, that dark enemy was born. Janos preyed upon its peasants until he was finally hunted down and executed. It should be noted, while Ustenheim is important to the greatest story and mythos of Legacy of Cain, the town itself in Blood Omen is largely inhabited with sleeping serfs and does not contain any abilities for us to collect. Thus, we will move the story forward as we race north to the reputed Dark Eden. Entering the crevice to the north, we sense a distinct shift of the natural harmonies. The air thick with pungent aromas tinged by a sickly sweet smell. The source we find is just ahead, as the road is crudely barred with boulders as a warning. But worse yet, a living corpse idles near a fleshy plant that spews plumes of noxious gas. The fleshy sentinel emits spike barbs that shoot in all directions and catch us by surprise. A hazardous introduction to those who dare flirt with the dangers that lie even on the outskirts of this deadly paradise. Leveraging our magical barrier, we're shielded from any barbs flung our way, dispatching the horrific experiments. Barring the fleshy plant that's rooted deep in the earth, we pause to collect ourselves, commenting in disbelief. <laughs> The poor wretch was warped beyond recognition. To think it was once human. Hey, fix us! Such strange creatures that had been spawned by this dark magic. Things half insect and half mammal. Human torsos grafted onto abominations of the flesh. Sick as it was, I couldn't help but admire its creator's ingenuity. A belching bag of flesh that resembles half man, half slug, slivers to halt our intrusion. Above the cancelled congregation, we discover a blood fountain. The blood of ages flows so sweet. Come drink from us. Your magic energy recovers more quickly, for our blood enhances. Its magic is a welcome gift for the battle ahead. To the west, we find another mangled inhabitant, somehow looking like a dolphin mounted a dog with teeth protruding every which way. If it could be said that a land descended into madness, it would be an accurate account of Dark Eden. A garden of horrors, seeded with sick perversion of nature's design. I knew that this dark Eden I had trespassed upon would continue to grow until all of Nosgoth was consumed. 
Magic seethed and shifted. I watched the dome of energy as it expanded, absorbing and recreating, consuming life and leaving behind only a twisted parody. Ahead, we find a score more of the fiends and decide it best to only put those in our direct path out of their living hell. As we stride northeast, we see the ground bears a brindle coloration. The rock gray and cracked bears the hallmarks of a volcano ahead that laid bare its contents eons ago. Following the trail to the northwest, we emerge in the heart of the volcano and inside the reddened dome. A single soldier moves to intercept us to no avail. <coughs> We then stop to recount. I passed through the wall unharmed. It seemed the magic only preyed on things that were alive and pure. Or perhaps it simply decided that I was twisted enough. With the circle's guardians so close, we know that their minions' efforts to thwart us will rise like a tide of blood. Thus, we sprint in our bestial form through the dilapidated village, probing for a way to cross the massive river of lava. Our fur singed as we put a stray foot too close to the boiling molten rock. It's only as we see a lone patrolman taunt us from the safety across said river do we use our guile and flick a mind control spell at his person. Taking on his likeness, we stroll over to a nearby switch to open the previously impassable lava. Repeating this process until we hop across the rest of the lava like a flea, we see our objective in range commenting. A tower stood in the distance. From its apex spewed the vortex of energy that shaped the lands below. And thus, we knew, to quell the tide of abominations that threatened to overwhelm Nosgoth itself, we must shut down whatever heretical experiment in alchemy that had birthed these abominations. Entering its source from the east, we see a dark tower in the center of the volcano. Its entrance is only a few meters wide. Stepping inside, it's clear that the outer structure belied the true breadth of the building as we remark. The surface of the castle belied its interior, for it was far larger inside than out. With the powers the circle had at its disposal, it would have been simple to distort space to accommodate this strange structure. Heading through the western door, we find the ghastly epicenter of experiments. The sorcerer's sanctuary, his laboratory. Inside was all manner of items arcane, pickled bodies, dissected corpses, both man and beast, and metal construct that heaved arcs of energy into the air. I sensed more than one force being manipulated in this place. Strange. Rarely did a sorcerer condescend to work with others. Shielding ourselves from the fleshy projectiles and their origins, only pausing to feed, we unbar the east and western doors. This takes us past the main hall and through the northern doors to unlock jewel dungeons, each with their own spell and armor. To the west, we see the armor painting and follow its door commenting. This armor, wrought with the blood of noblemen, drains the blood from my enemies for me, leaving me to focus on the slaughter at hand. Back in the main room, we then head up the eastern stairs, seeing a picture of a spirit leaving a body in a gruesome manner. In the next room, we find the spell card. It is a spell worthy of the necromancer himself. This allows me to dissect a creature's soul from its vessel of flesh, for these poor wretches only oblivion awaits. We then test said spell on the next shambling corpse to surprising effect. Satisfied with witnessing their spirit literally ripped from their body, we drink deep before departing for the battle ahead. Inside the main hall, we see the center door to the north is now unlocked, and stepping inside, our enemies await. Ah, not one, but three. Dejul the Energist, Bane the Druid, and Anacroth the Alchemist. How considerate of them to hasten my search. So the scourge of the circle has arrived! Fear him not, Bane. He is but a whelp. His soul is ours for the taking. Don't be ridiculous, Malak, to our aid. Ooh. Damn you, alchemist. I had not come this far only to have my quarry escape. Vengeance. Vengeance for my eternity of suffering. 
whelp. As if you knew what eternity was. Grovel before your true master. Never. I pack you from crotch to gizzard and feed what's left to your brides. As Vorador clashed against Malik, I gave pursuit to the fleeing wizards, the Jewel and Bane. I danced their dance. When the time came, they would dance upon my sword. His magic is weak! Mid his taunts, we slash at Bane with our fiery sword as he proclaims. He is an affront to nature itself! It is our duty to purify him! It's not just Bane we're forced to contend with, as we are peppered by De Jules' energy bolts, taking an unexpected dip. We are now between a rock and a hard place in dealing with the sorceresses. We either fell De Jules but face being drowned by the druid, or we quell Bane's attempt to burn us with an ever-growing puddle network exposing ourselves to De Jules' energy bolts. And thus, with quick thinking, we cast an energy barrier, allowing us to stalk down Bane first, brandishing our fiery sword as he impotently tries to sidestep us in vain, hoping his cheap tricks of waterworks and cowardice would succeed. With a triumphant cry, we cut down the druid. Hey, Victus! <laughs> After which his helm lay on the ground, the only evidence of his existence, and we collected say. The antler headdress had broken in the fight, but power still resided in its ivory form. Now, with the druid deceased, we have De Jules to contend with. The energy guardian, however, lives up to her name. Surrounded by two dozen spinning orbs, we quickly discern that we cannot breach the gap between us and opt to lob our own projectiles at the vexing vixen. Her orbs spin, protecting her energetic form. But as we fling flays, we find gaps appear in her defenses, and it only takes a few paltry projectiles to pierce her veil and rend her asunder causing us to chuckle as the earth quakes around her. Shifting into our mist form, we casually cross the river and pluck the Energist's cloak from a lonely island. The cloak is made from an alloy akin to lead, heavy and malleable, woven into fine links. The energy she controlled was stored in this garment. Exiting the small forest via teleporter. We're shocked to find Malik's armored form spread out across the floor. I found Malik's helmet amongst the scattered remnants of his armor, whole and intact. Vorador had finally laid his old adversary to rest. With all three totems now in tow, we return to the pillars and Ariel to restore them one by one. The helmet of Malik I placed before the pillar of conflict. The pillar accepted its offering. Thus, it was restored. The act had taken on the feel of ritual. Isn't it strange how we must bribe our gods to stay? At the foot of the energy pillar, I set the cloak of De Joule. The pillar accepted its offering. Thus, it was restored. The antler headdress of the druid Bane I lay before the nature pillar. The pillar accepted its offering. Thus, it was restored. Post defeating De Jules the Energist and Bane the Druid, we return their offerings to the Circle, restoring their pillars, and once the now familiar ritual is complete, the spirit Ariel cryptically guides. You must seek Azimuth the Planar at the heart of Avernus. Three instruments await you to aid you in your quest, but first you must rise and you must fall and find your salvation in between. And so we leave for Avernus with little more than a passing mention of three items that we must obtain. 
first by rising and then by falling. Ironic that the one who dispensed said advice has fallen so far. Taking up the bat form, we find ourselves by the now abandoned fortress in Dark Eden. We then enter a cave to the south that we'd noticed during our rugged climb to its peak. On the southeastern side of the cave, the wretched creatures still linger in the volcanic masses outskirts. Leaving the ashen terrain, we then find a small vantage point to the broken city of Avenus, commenting, Avenus consumed itself before my eyes. To the south, we see a horde of undead, perhaps the victims of Eden's outliers, re-risen to block our path. Their presence compels us to double our haste towards the smoking village ahead. Outside the walls of Avernus, we witness its denizens meander about as if unaffected by the bulk of their city burning about them, stopping to quickly feed with the aid of our armor, hacking off odd limbs and parading in a gust of crimson sustenance. It's only when we've had our fill of the almost hypnotized villagers. We then approach Avernus's walls, wary of the true danger its casual countenance belies, remarking, The gate of Avernus opened slowly before me, daring me to cross the threshold. Who was I to reject such an invitation? Entering the walls of this city, the facade remains almost wholly unmolested. Well, Superficially, much to our surprise, the guards sprang on us as if awaiting our arrival. <laughs> as a quick aside, the city itself is quite sprawling, however we are driven to complete Kane's quest, and so shall be skipping the smaller residents that boast some items and wares that can be found scattered about. Instead, we make our way past the guards to the southeastern end of the town, in which rubble appears near the doorway, a sign of things to come. Inside, we contend with two guards, their counterpart impaled in a shocking display. Clearly, there was a far more insidious hand at play, and we begin to see the first pernicious effects in the basement below. Unlike the outer cloister of the city, the basement boasts an onslaught of mages and their homing energy bolts, forcing us to make the hard choice between the mist form to save our skin from sizzling in the muddy waters underfoot, or the magical barrier to protect us from the torrent of blasts from the unholy sorcerers. Coming out topside, we find we're met by a group of invisible spectres seemingly conjured by a symbol written in blood. Stepping outside, we then find that this is just the beginning of unholy conjurations, as we see before us the maleficent handiwork of a far more sinister threat at hand. The city was paved in blood and flesh, yet what would have appalled me in life only tempted me in death. Once I would have felt horror, now only hunger remained. Stepping past the disemboweled corpse, again, the guards dutifully stand knee-deep in gore, awaiting our arrival, clearly in concert with whatever malevolent force had taken hold of the city. The outer cloister seemingly a ruse to the true depths of depravity that lie ahead. <laughs> Avernus lay in ruins before me. Whatever hand slaughtered its people ravaged the city as well. The beast paused for a moment, drooling in anticipation of the fine meal he saw before him. To his disappointment, he would not find me such easy prey. It's then we see one of the causes of the city's destruction. Casting our magical barrier, we hack at the demon until it bursts into flames. With bodies strewn about, we see our path forward is not in the defiled homesteads, but hidden between the cracks of the home it was guarding. Shifting to our mist form, we step through the wall. The beast inside holding a citizen hostage, the other butchered and hung on the wall as a macabre prize. We dutifully sidestep the morbid scene in an almost imperceptible crack in the eastern wall. Again, we're faced with a troop of demonic figures spitting energy bolts and repeat the same puzzle the just forced us in, this time in mist form, stalking our way through the narrow halls until we surface into an even grislier scene above. Exiting the maddening maze, 
we come face to face with an actual demon. I felt its eyes upon me, eager, hungry, as if it longed to rip my heart out and eat it before me as I died. I laughed as the onslaught began. Perhaps when it was over, it would be the other way around. Resolving to somehow understand the source of this demonic invasion and to be their scourge, we pause, shifting into our own wolf form and race with tunnel vision ahead, remembering the guardian Ariel had spoken of that to obtain the three items needed to fell Azimuth and her kin, we need first to rise and then fall. Entering its large doors, we find our instincts are wholly correct as a duo of hooded priests move to intercept our unwanted intrusion. Avernus was a religious autocracy, with the cathedral as its dais of power. Though the city lay in ruins, the cathedral remained untouched. The demons knew better than to bite the hand that feeds them. As irony would have it, unlike the city, the church's architecture remains somewhat pure, serene even. However, the dark intent of its new inhabitants and taint permeate to its core. The layout, seemingly a maze of teleporters that require the most patience of mind to find the hidden switches. Pressing forward with the patience of a saint, unlike the demons, we dodge the deadly claws of the entities that claim the structure for their own demented desire. But what did the former inhabitants seem to covet? The demonic entities didn't merely dwell here, but rather seemed to be searching for something powerful, hidden and elusive that we certainly are destined to find first. It should be noted, in their southeastern room near the main hall is an easily missed exit to the south that leads to a hellish area laden with bone and gore. Inside the mass grave's architecture, we find a bounty of items and spells to be replenished. Heading through the central path leads us to a single book, next to a skull and sword atop a dais and holds an interesting bit of lore. And Hashak Gix spoke unto the world. And Hashak Gix spoke unto the world, and all who heard trembled. Bring me your firstborn, and shed their blood upon the altar of the world, so that I may take nourishment from them. Do this without question, or suffer my wrath for eternity. And its will was done. Back in the church's main nave, past the altar to the east, we enter a room with a picture of a serpentine sword, which is the first dungeon of the area, that of the Soul Reaver. As Ariel had correctly divined, we indeed are transported higher into an almost astral plane-like area, dodging arrows and icy floors underfoot, traps set by its unknown guardians whose mystical blood replenishes our magical stores. Perhaps they are spirits bound to guard the blade. Teleporting to the area's most northern tip, we find ourselves uncannily high above Nosgoth. Somehow detached, its beauty lying beneath our viewing chamber as if we've departed the mortal realm entirely and now reside in the heavens above. Congruently, we find the Soul Reaver blade guarded by an angelic figure. Cautiously, we pluck it from its heavenly guardian, unaccosted, remarking. Time fades even legend, and the origin of Soul Reaver has been lost long ago, but its purpose remains to feed on the souls of any creature it strikes. Kindred, this blade and I. With a sense of destiny swirling about us, we equip the blade. <coughs> With our rise complete, we then look at our next step to fall. Eager to test out a new weapon, we march through the church to the western wing. Our first victim in our sights, an unfortunate priest who unknowingly partakes in our own wicked sermon. 
The Reaver swaths through the air, leaving the priest in pieces, drinking deeply in its own primal screech, lusting for souls that it had been starved of for an unknown time. As an aside, although its power is indisputable, this mighty weapon is said to destroy all things with one swing. Obviously, this prevents us, like axes, from drinking blood. Furthermore, there is a cost for such power. Use of the sword drains magic on a one-to-one -one ratio with the hit points of the creatures killed. For instance, if we destroy a creature with 30 hit points, it will drain 30 magic points. If we run out of magic, the Soul Reaver converts to just a regular iron sword. Obviously, it also stops us from using magic spells and objects with its two-handed nature, hence why we still rely on our flame sword for most of our grunt work ahead. Exploring the church's eastern wing, we find ourselves by a picture of the coveted Wraith armor and a Cerberus-like hound defending its dungeon dungeon's entrance. Indeed, it's only after contending with scores of these dogs, their masters, the demons, skeletons, and other various hellish undead is our fall, shall we say, complete. At the very base of the church lies a hellish pit, complete with flaming hot magma below. Entering a skull-lined entrance to a cave, we find ourselves in a perverse place of worship, immediately discerning the true nature of the carnage before us as we stare at Malik's actual corpse strung up in the center of the circles. And it seems like this is where certain members of the circle performed their rites and rituals. In the northern corner, like the Reaver, the Wraith armor is set on a pedestal, this time made of stretched out flesh and sinew of some poor victim of indescribable torture. This armor was spawned in the most impure of spirit forges, tempered from the seething agony of tortured souls. The metal exists only partially in the human realm, causing it to fade between tangible and ethereal states. The Wraith armor, once equipped, we find splits damage between our health and magic meters, each taking half the blow. Pulsing in between realms in our new black armor, we cut a swath through the remaining priests now re-risen, stumbling into a picture of the aforementioned Malik versus Vorador in some twisted reverence of the Guardian before he was felled by his bitter rival. Above me stood a memory, etched in stained glass. Heading through the final door to the north, at last we meet the Planar, who is responsible for the demonic horde's invasion. Ah, what's this? I had not even realized the blade and the raiment were here. You wear those trinkets well, Cain, but I do believe that they would look better on me. The matriarch of Avernus, the Lady Azimuth. Her magical planing skills summon demons through runes inscribed in human blood. We desperately lunge at Azimuth to no avail, and the planar fades from sight. A powerful ability indeed. Following her into her lair, Azimuth, so sure of her victory, taunts. Come to me, my children. We shall ravage Nazgoth together. So, little man, have they sent you to stop me? We begin to dispatch her children with ease, finding the planar immediately peppering us with vile green energy bolts, her demons resummoned when we cross the threshold of her blood seals. <laughs> My children shall rip you apart. Come, my demons, let us sup on vampire blood. Desperate, we charge at Azimuth. However, when we breach the gap, the planar lives up to her name, teleporting to the opposite end of the room, all the while dancing and laughing, peppering us with green energy bolts. Again, we chase her down. The flame of our blade then barely licks her hide before she escapes, wholly frustrated. We again dispatch a demonic duo, but instead of crossing the seal, we plant ourselves firm. Remembering the soul reaver, which cries for the planar soul, we realize we have but one gambit at beating the bald banshee. Divining her cheap trick, we hurl an energy bolt from across the room, which she dutifully teleports away from to us and the reaver's biting embrace. <laughs> 
For all her magic, the Lady Azimuth was little trouble. Once her demonic thralls had been dispatched, she fell quickly to my blade. Azimuth, third eye, a gift from the Pillar of Dimensions, allowed the planar sight into other realms. The Pillar reclaims its own. With the planar azimuth in pieces and a trinket in hand, we moved to leave the forsaken church via a northeastern door. Curiously, another device awaits our arrival. It will deliver you in time. Exiting Avenus with the time streaming device in hand, we find a nearby bat flight point and return to restore the pillars and learn more of this strange time streaming device from the former guardian of balance, Ariel. Before the dimension pillar, I lay the eye of Azimuth. The pillar accepted its offering. Thus, it was restored. Well done. You have found Mobius's toy. Azimuth, not content with summoning demonic thrall, stole the time streaming device in order to gather creatures from other ages as well. Take care of the device, Cain. It will deliver you in time. The legions of the Nemesis are on the march from the north, crushing all in their path. T'was not too long ago that the Nemesis was known as William the Just, a caring and gentle benefactor of the land. But as his army grew in strength and he himself grew in power, the veil of tyranny fell, and one kingdom was not enough. So many cities, so many dead. Willendorf will be sure to follow. The nemesis must be stopped, or all shall be lost. How can one stop an army? You must rally the forces of Willendorf. They are the last hope of Nosgoth. With Ariel's guidance, we pause to look at Mobius's former toy. Time streaming device. Sensing our path has deviated thanks to the bitter war Nosgoth is embroiled in, we begrudgingly take upon our task anew to aid Willendorf against the Nemesis. Its city lies south of Avenus, and so we follow the path out of the city's outskirts, met with brigands anew. <laughs> We pause in our slaughter to contemplate. The spectre of Ariel led me to Willendorf. If I was to defeat the next member of the circle, I needed to understand his machinations. With this vague advice in mind, I set forth on the road to Willendorf. Vain Victus! <laughs> Heading east, we find ourselves in the path of a local knight of the city duty-bound to attempt to thwart the lingering danger of an errant vampire to his own peril. As we feast on his blood, we find the familiar voice of our benefactor, Mortanius, who bears grim tidings. Strange, isn't it, Cain, that one cannot quite accept that which sustains him. You in your death, and me in mine. But death cannot reign in a world without life. And soon you will find the quest ahead of you is yours and yours alone. I can assist you no longer. Left alone now entirely, we pause to see the upcoming trials ahead. Willendorf, proud defender of the realm with its warrior elite and mighty ruler, King Ottmar. The Lion Throne had once held my allegiance, but Willendorf's days of glory had passed. It was the last bastion against an unruly future. Resuming our wolf form, we bound to the east, dodging another knight and entering a nearby cave to the north. Inside, we see the walls are smattered with blood, indicative of intruders caught by the deluge of arrows that rain endlessly. Up ahead, we see what the traps are guarding. With a picture on the ground denoting the Spirit Rack Dungeon. Inside the musty dungeon, we find our prize below and inaccessible. It's only by leveraging the mind control ability do we obtain its counterpart. With this spell, I can tear a creature's soul from its body, leaving its vacant flesh mine to control. 
Activating the ability, we use our enemies as pawns, allowing us to possess their form and exit the cave, bounding down the path and ignoring the dreary denizens and guards alike to find another cave below of an equally important blood fountain. The blood of ages flows so sweet. Come drink from us. Your strength has increased, for our blood enhances. Now, with our strength enhanced, we loop back up the eastern path and see a sign that reads... Mighty Willendorf had sliced open the belly of the earth, reaping a bounty of precious metals and unearthing ancient secrets. Of these secrets, I had heard of a tomb that contained an ancient forefather of King Otmar himself. Within the tomb, a fountain of blood would allow me to cast the most noble of illusions and gain entry to the city of the mighty lion. Heading up the trail, we find we're now able to move aside the previously impassable boulder. Entering the cave to the east, inside we see a familiar picture of Cain holding a mask in front of his face. The dungeon's prize, buried neath a working mine shaft, now catering to the Empire's need of precious ores it holds. Unfortunately, the fountain below is equally as prized, and we cut a path through workers and guards alike to obtain the contents of its blood fountain that lies deep in its bowels. The blood of ages flows so sweet. Come drink from us. Unlike the Mask of Disguise, this spell actually allows me to cast away the guise of death for a time, allowing me to walk among the living undisturbed. The spell also provides a visage of nobility, for there are many who would easily divulge more to those of highborn blood. Exiting the final cave with the skies intact, we find ourselves on the eastern portion of Willendorf. As a somewhat predictable aside, Willendorf is a sizable location worth exploring. However, for expediency's sake and the pressing matter of the circle and the nemesis spelling Nosgoth's doom, we forego the urge to pilfer each individual abode's contents. Instead, momentarily, we stop by Willendorf's library found to the south. Once inside, we comment. The Great Library of Willendorf. Filled with dull tomes of trite accounts by pompous historians about matters that couldn't possibly be of interest to anyone but themselves. In the northern room of the archives, we do happen to stumble upon quite an interesting piece of literature regarding the nature of the Circle's guardians. The book spoke of the birth of the Circle. The Circle served the pillars, protectorates to the strange power that gives life to our land. At the unlikely death of a member, the circle remains broken for a time until the pillars can cull a worthy successor. I came upon another book of interest, buried deep amongst the library tomes. It spoke of a small cult that existed in Nosgoth ages past. Wherever they travelled, strange tales of human possession would follow. Little is known of the god they worshipped. Heading north, we find the proud lion's den. However, entering with our regal front intact, we see Otmar's once befitting sigil belies a broken man atop a throne. The court of King Otmar, shades of my former existence, proud and self-absorbed, surrounded by all the finery of the realm, secure in their ignorance. As I walked among them, I smirked, thinking of the carnage fall them at the hands of the legions of the nemesis, the glorious flames, and the inevitable rape and pillage. Out of my way, peasant! The stench of the fields hangs over you like a pall. The king sees no one. He is in mourning for the princess. He'll be in mourning for his kingdom soon, and he'll mourn for you even sooner if you don't get out of my way! And so I won my audience, such as it was, with Otmar. He cared not for the invading armies from the north, only of the plight of his child. Her birthday present. To celebrate her birthday, I declared a contest. Whoever created the finest doll in the realm would be granted a royal favor. Hundreds of dolls were brought, but the winner was obvious. Elzevir the doll maker created a toy of such beauty that all were captivated by it. 
and all he would take in payment was a lock of her hair. Soon after, she became like this, a lifeless puppet. Whoever restores her to her former self shall have this kingdom! Thus, my hunt for the Dollmaker began. My daughter, I fear I shall never hear her delicate laugh again. Oh. Otmar slumped on his throne like a rag doll, his beard matted with tears of his own self-pity. In my court, he would have long since been usurped by one stronger, but in Willendorf, they worshipped him, even in his weakness. I wondered what Willendorf would do when Otmar's death finally arrived. With one step forward and two steps back, we begin our new objective, to hunt down this toy maker. Thanks to a western underground path found near the exit of the castle that supposedly leads directly to his lair. Through whispers of the court, I learned that the army of the Last Hope, Willendorf's proud militia, was in no condition to fight the invading legions of the Nemesis. They were busy scouring the lands to the north in search of the Dollmaker and Otmar's daughter. I also learned of a tunnel which would take me rapidly from Willendorf to the suspected area. Although the guards swarm us as our noble guy slips, our purpose takes precedence, and we stride through the castle's narrow halls and emerge to a wholly different scene. <laughs> Finding ourselves in the wretched cold on the western side of a fortress, the nemesis guards, garbed in demonic red armor, rush to meet us in battle. Bay <laughs> After stunning and feeding on a few sentries, we begin to succumb to the bitter cold lamenting. Even the gentle snowfall is lethal to a vampire's well-being. With quick thinking, we use the mind control spell on a guard atop the ramparts, forcing his clone with commands to unlock the door with a lever on both sides. After which, our entry is wide open, and we feast on a glut of soldiers inside slaking our thirst before entering the tower's dungeon, re-emerging on the other side and shifting into our beast form before being swarmed by the many minions of the nemesis who lie in wait. Racing up the northern path, we discover we've emerged near a bloody remains of another city. This was once the most academic of cities, housing some of the most prestigious universities in all of Nosgoth. While I would not weep over lost tomes, I detested the sight of scars left upon the world at the hands of the Nemesis. To the east, we loop around its wooden stake wall, dexterously ducking between buildings and dodging the army that has taken up residence. Once the heart of Nosgoth's academia, Stahlberg suffered greatly at the hands of the Legion of the Nemesis, whose warriors patrol the streets, bodies litter the road, and the smell of death is everywhere. And so we make our visit short, moving north, seeing a gargantuan statue erected in the visage of the Nemesis. We then head west through his makeshift tent encampment of his soldiers, and find a single beast guarding an impassable steel gate, post contending with the ragged guard. We then leverage the holes in the tattered fabric, seeing another of its kin meandering about and casting Rack Mind to take control of the bizarre creature. His doppelganger easily unlocks the gate in the process. Heading north of the icy field ahead, we finally find the sprawling abode of the infamous toy maker. The interior littered with odd dolls, toy bears, and other creations left to gather dust. The music then changes to an unsettling melody that perhaps was meant to amuse a child. However, it takes on a more sinister tone, more aptly described as a trance or lullaby of a madman. As we traverse the perverse palace of the lunatic, we learn at closer inspection, the beasts we burned outside were mere puppets to this toy maker, bound to serve his every whim, a rather grim fate and twisted as any creation that we'd seen thus far 
at the hands of the circle. Plumbing its depths, we finally encounter the deranged toy maker in his queer workshop of horrors. Elsevier, I have come for the soul. So, Otmar sent you to kill me, eh? I can smell him on you. Or is that the stench of the grave? Dollmaker, I have no time for these games. The soul is mine! I earned it! Otmar gave it to me! Then you shall earn it with blood. You shall not have it! Mine! 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 As the Dollmaker paces the room, shouting and throwing sewing needles, he touches piles of rags which turn into his rag dolls. These are swiftly dispatched with a flame sword which burn them up. Otherwise, they simply reconstitute after being hit. However, every time we strike the Dollmaker, as projectiles will do him no damage, a teddy bear emerges from the cupboard and attacks us. These explode when touched, hence why we need to hit them at the farthest reach of our sword, or when in a protective cocoon of magic to avoid taking damage. Finally, after enough hits, the Dollmaker loses his head. <laughs> What an odd little man. Now, to find the soul. Stepping over his corpse, we explore the northern room to find it is the bastard's boudoir, in which he slept ever so snugly with the gruesome patchwork doll holding the soul of Otmar's daughter. Upon retrieving the doll, we comment. Elzevir imprisoned the girl's soul in a small fabric doll. The old man's intentions I shall never know. With the demented doll maker Elvizir dead, and Otmar's daughter's avatar, a doll carrying her soul in hand, we depart the icy fortress of the deceased toy maker, making haste via flight to Otmar's castle in Willendorf. We sense our time before the nemesis claiming Nosgoth draws near. I entered the court with the doll maker's head in one hand and the doll containing the girl's soul in the other. I placed them both before the king and watched his eyes catch fire. With the doll in their possession, the court sorcerers could restore his daughter's soul. I do not know that I can thank you enough, warrior. My kingdom is but a small price to pay for my daughter's life. Willendorf is yours, if you wish it. It is not your kingdom I desire, but your army, Otmar. I require troops to vanquish the horde that descends upon us from the north. Very well. Courtiers, fetch me my armor and mace. There is war to be waged! The scourge of Nosgoth is upon us, friends. We shall die today as heroes, lest we live tomorrow as slaves. Ready thine arms for Nosgoth! In the distance I saw the Nemesis armies march forward, a black tide that would soon wash over the armies of the Hope. Although the Army of Hope would win smaller skirmishes thanks in part to their morale being bolstered by the renewed vigour of their king, they were, for all accounts, vastly outnumbered. However, we only need to kill one of their ranks, being that of the Nemesis, and so we slip between smaller brawls, attacking only where we deem fit. They came at me in throngs, no fervour as strong as that inspired by a madman. The Nemesis armies were fierce and showed no signs of subsiding. Spearheading the fight, we find, was King Otmar. Without helm, his proud bald head glistens with sweat as he fights off his demonic assailants. Age, it seems, hasn't slowed him down in battle, but the odds are stacked heavily against him. Although we aid the army where we can, the battle quickly devolves into a free-for-all and our need for blood begins to overwhelm. 
I sated my thirst on warriors of horde and hope alike, the dying relinquishing their final moments to give me strength. As we turn to our new ally, we see Otmar rushed by two of the Nemesis warriors. The Nemesis and his horde fall upon us, my friend. I fear I can defend Nosgoth no longer. The Nemesis must be destroyed. For my daughter Cain. For the world. The tide turned with Otmar's death. I watched as the remaining survivors of the Armies of Hope fled to the safety of the forest. The battle had decided its victor. The fate of Nosgoth now lay in the Nemesis' hands. <laughs> With the war all but lost, we make a break north to a nearby tower, our objective standing. Stepping over the sea of fallen warriors, it is clear hope is dead, and so is its army. In its wake, a sea of the nefarious nemesis begins to swarm, almost coalescing in a cloud, threatening to swallow us entirely. We attempt to sprint towards shelter, passing two crucified soldiers as we climb to the tower's entrance. We then hear a wholly unfamiliar sound, a slight click, as the time stream device activated itself on our person. At once the battlefield was gone. Where the ground was caked with blood and dirt, there was lush greenery. Where chaos reigned only moments before, this damning calm prevailed. Alas, it seemed I was stranded here. The time-streaming device lay in pieces at my feet. Exploring our unfamiliar setting, we're interrupted by an errant guard who falls easily enough. However, when we drink his blood, we're also gifted a strange vision of his memories and the time stream of sermon therein. Would you stand idle as vermin destroy your crops? No! no! As your house burned? No! no! Will you allow this evil to continue? No! Will the wickedness end? Yes! Do you believe? Yes! yes! Then take me to your king, so that I can prepare you for the onslaught. Knowing now it was Mobius who orchestrated the rise of the Nemesis, we make our way north on a quest to hunt down William, this time without his army on our heels. We soon see the town of Stahlberg intact, and beyond to the north, an unfinished statue of William. Everything suddenly becomes clear, and we comment. Ah, so it seemed I was in the land of William the Just. Fifty years before the battle I had just escaped would take place. Further north up the path, we find the young King Citadel, still heavily guarded by his demonically armoured soldiers, but not entirely impregnable. The stronghold of William the Just. It was time for me to pay a visit to he who would become the nemesis and force Nosgoth on its knees. Drinking deep from the Crimson Soldiers, we enter William's fortress. <laughs> 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 Finding a formidable force intact, giddy with the anticipation that we may still confront a young William catching him unaware. We cast repel on ourselves as to step past his forces, who attack with their crude weapons in vain, finding the king unfortunately and the time streamer mid-conversation below. Yes, the, these weapons you've provided will see to that. Uh, uh, pray tell, Mobius, what game do you play? None, my lord. I only wish to aid you in vanquishing your foes. The weapons are but a token of my goodwill. A and the news you bring, a vampire said to slay me? Where did you come upon such knowledge? 
It is of no consequence, sire. It was only out of concern for your majesty's life. Perhaps, perhaps. Very well, then. You may leave me now, but should I wish to speak to you? I will know, your majesty, and I shall be there in time. Curious, we see William gifted a younger incarnation of the very soul reaver we carry, a parting gift from Mobius. A devastating revelation, to be sure. In the northern tip of the tower, we're then rushed by William's remaining forces, finding a floor that mimics the viewing chamber we saw high above Nosgoth, this time with a map painted on the ground and swords stuck in several key locations, denoting a vast war room and the beginnings of the boy king's efforts of expansion and conquest. In the final room above, William knowingly greets us, thanks to Mobius's treachery welcoming. Ah, yes, the vampire. Uh, Mobius told me you would come. <laughs> With the king's personal guard set to envelop us, we sidestep them and his devastating blade, using a pentalich of terror to destroy his minions. It's then we're left alone for a final duel with the man who promises to destroy the soul of Nosgoth. We find in his youth that William is strong in will as with his sword arm. However, he hasn't had the time to become accustomed to the nuance and demands of the Reaver. As such, we safely stand behind the Repel Stell, warding off the Reaver's desire to drink deeply from our soul as it thirstily drains William's own energy stores. We unleash the power of the Reaver, hefting it in a cataclysmic blow. As his guards rushed to save him, William the Just's blood was already renewing my strength, replacing the life his sword had stolen from my veins. The poor fools come to aid their fallen leader. Let us have some amusement. With William dead, the nemesis threat is no more. His body lay broken, as is his own twin reaver, which he was gifted inexplicably by the mysterious oracle. Unfortunately, we find ourselves still stranded in time. But as fate would have it, time is inexplicably on our side. As we head to the northern room above, we find a twin time-streaming device intact. A time-streaming device? Strange. When coincidence seems too convenient, I prefer to call it fate. With William the Just dead, Mobius's plans have been thwarted. His pawn was removed from the game. The castle's interior had changed. Once swarms of the Nemesis soldiers filled its halls, now in their stead, grubby miscreants who seem to serve no master bar their haggard hopes of sending us back to the grave whence we came. Exiting the castle, we then realize... I found myself once more in the Nosgoth I knew. The carnage from battle was gone, yet there was something amiss. From the distance, I heard cries, and a breeze from the south carried with it the faint odor of vampire blood. Shapeshifting, we tear through the village south of the Nemesis' old citadel a final time, pursued by angry villagers, until we come across a statue of the Nemesis that lay in ruin. <laughs> It would seem the folly fell upon my own shoulders. With their sainted King William dead by my hand, the people of the land were consumed by a hunger all their own, for vampire blood. Indeed, our revelation is a bitter pill. Somehow, we are now a greater target of the ire to the humans of Nosgoth, actively hunted through Stalberg to the south. As I wandered about more, the shrieking and cheering became more apparent and defined. There was some sort of gathering to the south, for with each cheer, I smelled an outpour of blood. 
I make no pretense to justify my killing, yet these vampire hunters would cloak their bloodlust beneath a veil of righteousness. Hypocrites! They would make themselves judge and jury. Very well then. Let us see how they... Dispatching the final of our hunters, the copper smell of blood hangs in the air, and we behold a gruesome spectacle. The townsfolk gathered around a guillotine, baying for blood. Would you be free of the plague if only one city was cleansed? No! no! Would you spare one wolf in the pack that has devastated your herd? No! no! Then let us destroy them all! Yes! He is the last! Destroy him! The people will not rest until Nosgoth is purged of your kind. I had been betrayed. In my haste, I had not realized it before. That sigil on his forehead, the Oracle of Nosgoth, was in fact the time streamer Mobius, and I had followed his advice. How much of my quest was of his design? Willendorf? The Battle of the Last Stand? William the Just? Was this the trap he had fashioned for me? We will send you back to the grave whence you came, vampire. <laughs> I have seen the future, Ken. You are not in it. The repugnant time streamer slips our grasp every time we get within striking range, forcing us to stalk him down deeper in the fortress until we realize his trap has been sprung. Mobius then begins to pepper us with energy bolts semi-safe atop his own perch. However, we are not defenseless and encapsulate ourselves in the repel spell, warding off his pathetic magics with ease and unleashing a torrent of bolts back at the schema who desperately summons forth aid from different ages. A pentalich of tarot obliterates his first wave of enemies much to his chagrin. Sensing Mobius is in danger, he retreats once more. Following a similar pattern, the time streamer again calls forth his lackeys, displacing them out of time, only to see them disintegrate in a spray of gore. From the present! <laughs> Mobius, clearly desperate, slips our grasp atop the final platform. Above us he stands and calls forth his most prized of puppets. And from ages yet to come. Contending with the greatest and perhaps most handsome warrior in Nosgoth is no easy task. His cane doppelganger attacks with the fury of a burning sun. However, what it possesses in raw melee prowess, they are but a copy nonetheless. And while our magical barrier takes a beating, we quickly discern the one gift that had broken upon the nemesis corpse that Mobius himself had gifted. The Soul Reaver. What better weapon to fell our false future self with? Mobius mistakenly steps down from his perch, unfortunately, as he materializes directly into the path of a single mighty swing of the Reaver. <laughs> Ironic. By going back in time and altering the past, you turn William the Just into the nemesis. I, you have seen my plan, vampire, as I have seen your destiny. The future says you die. But I am dead. As are you. Oh. 
I knew that Mobius's hourglass was the focus of his time-streaming magic. Farewell, sorcerer. The sands of time have ceased to flow for you. With Mobius dead, we've returned to the pillars for the Guardian of Balance Ariel's advice in finding the elusive final members of the Circle. Instead, we witness a scene play out between our one-time benefactor Mortanius, the Guardian of Death, and the vexing alchemist Anacroth, who had previously eluded our grasp. You betrayed us, Mortanius. You had Cain killed and turned him into a monster. You set him upon us. It had to be. Napraptor's insanity poisoned all of our minds. The Circle had failed in its sworn duties. It had to be destroyed. Failed our duties? Idiot! The Circle exists for us. We don't exist for it. Our powers will save or damn Nosgoth at our whim. Stand with us, Mortanius, or die. Then I shall die. The circle is to be destroyed. You have to die as well, Necromancer. I admire your cunning, but you will not escape your fate. Nay, I will embrace it, but my death will leave one more to take Princeling. Finish me! Mortanius sends forth his undead guardians. A nuisance, to be sure, but due to what we just witnessed, we know better than to trifle with the Avatar of Death. Two summoners block our path, but we focus them down lest we're overwhelmed by the infinite army of the undead. Once our path is unobstructed, we rush Mortanius, repel barrier already intact to bear the brunt of his first volley. However, to our surprise, he stands firm, eating the end of our blade with several slashes, all the while as he takes the brunt of our attack, summoning minions in a bid to deter our onslaught to no avail. Falling into nothingness, we believe ourselves victorious, somewhat prematurely, as explosive neon green skeletons begin to appear in waves. About facing, we find their source. Slashing through his flesh in a voluminous gush of blackened blood, the necromancer's body finally falls into nothingness by his robe left behind in a pile, or so we thought. <laughs> you thought yourself a king, when in fact you were a pawn. You have served me well, Cain. <laughs> I serve no one. Indeed, such narrow vision. Don't you see? My silencing of Ariel and its calculated repercussions is but the first act in my theater of grand pignol. The tragic hero. Play on, little vampire. Play on. Fay Victus! The body of Mortanius had completely been consumed by an unknown demonic entity. Whatever this demonic beast is, the necromancer was all but gone. And so we're left to face the Goliath demon in his wake. Being of brute strength and malevolent intent, the beast bounds into the pillar's dais, shaking the area nearby before diving at us and phasing through the ground wholly, only to single-mindedly repeat the process. During our bloody battle, we attempt to restore Mortanius and Anacroth's pillars in a frenzied bid to placate our attacker to no avail. The death orb of Mortanius had given the necromancer dominion over the grave. I had thought him the last of the circle, and yet he spoke of another. Before the pillar of death, I lay the orb of Mortanius. The pillar accepted its offering. Thus, it was restored. Hey, 
Anacroth's magic was contained within the metal of the scales and would eventually be released back into the pillar from whence it came. The scales of Anacroth I lay before the pillar of states. The pillar accepted its offering. Thus, it was restored. We then come to the conclusion. This is, for all intents and purposes, a war of attrition. Ironic. As a human, we would have been slain instantly. But as a vampire, we would be sustained by hearts of darkness. The vampiric gift of unlife gifted to us by Mortanius himself. The one obstacle that obstructed the demon's goals of pure domination. As night falls and the wind howls with the stinging rain upon our skin, our battle rages on and we know what we must do. Drawing the reaver, we focus our energies of very being into the blade, becoming one for a final, unassailable strike that rends the beast asunder. I am the last pillar, the only survivor of the Circle of Nine. At my whim, the world will be healed or damned. At my whim. With this terrible revelation, there is only one canon ending of Blood Omen. However, as we look at Ariel and see the promise of our sacrifice, we pause, realizing this was what she had intended all along. This, however, is not the canonical ending that Cain chooses. In his life, he was unknown, a petty noble. In death, he was unknown. Yet by choosing oblivion, he restored balance to the land. Shades cast no shadow. Nupraptor's madness even affecting the final guardian standing. We are unable to fulfill our duty as guardian, but also are a pawn no more to the pillars, sitting atop their destruction and embracing our role as ruler. They victus, suffering to the conquered. Once I embraced my powers, I realized that Vorador was correct. We are gods, dark gods. And it is our duty to thin the herd. <laughs>
Vi Victus. This means war. Also, I love you.